Caroline Middle School, I would ask that everyone would please find your seats. And out of respect for our board meeting, if you would, please put your cell phones on silent or vibrate. That would be appreciated. Good evening, school board members, CCPS families, students, staff, and the Caroline community. I, Dr. Jawanda Rollins-Fells, chair of the board, would like to call this January school board meeting to order. It is my privilege to welcome those attending here in person at Caroline Middle School, as well as those of you who may be viewing on our CCPS YouTube channel. Each provides an avenue for you to receive information heightened education, awareness, and an opportunity for involvement. The school board is grateful for your attendance as we continue to move our division in a forward direction as hashtag One Caroline. Again, welcome to the school board meeting, and I would now like the clerk to please call for the roll. Mrs. Nancy Carson, representing the Mattapan District. Mr. Sean Kelly, representing the Madison District. Dr. Jawanda Rollins-Fells, representing the Reedy Church District. Dr. Sarah Calvaric, superintendent of schools. Mr. George Spalding, representing the Bowling Green District. Mr. John Copeland, representing the Western Caroline District. Mr. Calvin Taylor, representing the Port Royal District. And I'm Lisa Stevens, clerk of the board. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. This meeting is now called to order. At this time, I would ask Mr. Spalding to please lead us in prayer. And then we will have our students from Madison Elementary please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Gracious Heavenly Father, in Lord as we come here tonight to discuss the things that we have to do for our citizens and our students in Caroline County, Lord. Lord, give us some wisdom to do the right thing and be with us during that time. Students from Madison Elementary, a round of applause and thank you to all of our parents this night, this evening. Outstanding. I want to take a moment as we start our meeting for 2023 to say Happy New Year to all of you. It is our desire that 2023 be the best year yet. And before we begin our board meeting, we will take a look back at a year in review. CCPS School Board is super proud to reflect on the Lotus Academy ribbon cutting ceremony and the board approved transportation compensation increase. If we could give a beep beep to our bus drivers that keep us rolling. In February, the Director of Federal Programs, Ms. Ross, receives the VASCD Impact Award. May we please give Ms. Ross a round of applause.
We had 15 elementary students participate in the all district chorus concert. We rolled right into March with our softball field ribbon cutting ceremony. This was a joint project with the Board of Supervisors and was a project that has been well received by our community. We kept it going in March with our student STEM expos and in April we had our first annual Partners in Education Appreciation event. Our CEF Fund's future teacher scholarships were also launched as we are committed to growing our own talent. In May, we were super proud that for the first time since COVID, we were able to bring in-person graduations back and we held our graduation at the University of Mary Washington. Let's not forget that we were recognized for $23,000 raised by Lewis and Clark for the Kids Heart Challenge. In June, we had a Caroline commitment bonus and we paid $1,000, $1,000 to all of our staff members. We hosted our CCPS leadership retreat, hosted our first CMS Eagle Camp and our superintendent super, excuse me, summer book club. Why? Because readers are leaders. In August, as we prepared for another school year, we kicked off our new strategic plan. You can find that on our website. It is where we have aligned our goals and we plan accordingly and hold ourselves accountable. Achieve 2027 is what we called it. We've also launched our cybersecurity and entrepreneurship course at CHS so that we could broaden our horizon of course offerings. In September, we received the Be Wet Watershed grant recipient of funds and we hosted our CCPS community kickball events where we got into the community all around for a little bit of friendly competition and family engagement. In October, there was something huge that happened for Caroline County Public Schools, and for the first time, we host our own Head Start grant where we provide early education to our youngest students. Let's not forget classrooms with our Promethean boards for K-2, which brings technology front and center in circle time and in instruction. In November, we had our football and field hockey district coaches of the year. We know they're great in Caroline County, but they were voted by their peers. Also in November, I was recognized as the Virginia School Board Regional Member of the Year. And in December, we paid another $1,000 bonus for all employees. And we honor Miss Melanie Brown as the County Teacher of the Year. Could you please put your hands together as we celebrate our look back in 2022. It has been a plum pleasing pleasure, Dr. Monroe, to serve as your chair. And at this time, I would ask for the approval of the January 23, 2023 agenda. So moved. Second. The motion has been made by Mr. Kelly, second by Ms. Carson. Any discussion? No. Hearing none, I'd ask the clerk to please call for the vote. Ms. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Dr. Rollins Spells? Aye. The motion carries. The agenda is approved. At this time, I will relinquish the chair. To Dr. Calvary. Thank you, Dr. Rollins Fells. This first part of this evening's meeting is focused on the reorganization of the school board. Pursuant to the Virginia Code, Section 22.1-72, the board is required to establish a meeting schedule for the coming year, and Section 22.1-76 mandates that the board organize or reorganize annually with the election of officers at this first meeting in January. This reorganization includes the selection of the chair, vice chair, approval of 
the clerk, deputy clerk, superintendent's designee to attend meetings in the absence of the superintendent, student school board representative, approval of the meeting schedule for this calendar year, and confirmation of the school board and clerk code of ethics. As superintendent, I will preside at the selection of the chair and then transfer the gavel to the newly elected chair. The chair has multiple responsibilities for which the vice chair will fill in as needed. Some of these responsibilities are the following. The chair presides at regular meetings, special called meetings, workshops, joint meetings with the Board of Supervisors, and school board closed session meetings. Facilitates and moderates discussion among board members seeking consensus as appropriate using Robert's Rules of Order prepares board committee assignments, communicates regularly with other board members, keeping them informed of school matters, maintains ongoing contact with the superintendent on relevant school matters, prepares board agendas with the superintendent, takes the lead on contract negotiation, evaluation, and goal setting with the superintendent, takes the lead on developing priorities for school board annual goal setting and board professional development prepares and delivers in conjunction with the vice chair and the superintendent the approved school board budget presentation to the Board of Supervisors, signs contracts, official minutes, and resolutions approved by the board, approves board member local travel reimbursements online, and signs board, board member expense reimbursement vouchers, amongst many other duties as assigned. These activities and duties require a considerable amount of time and dedication by the chair and vice chair. This list is not all-inclusive, but does provide some idea of what is entailed with the duties and responsibilities of the chair and ultimately the vice chair if needed. These leadership positions are critical to the effectiveness of the board, and now we will proceed with the selection process. Board members, I will begin with the opening the floor for nominations for chair of the Caroline County School Board for the 2023 calendar year. Are there any nominations at this time? Dr. Calderic, I would like to nominate Mr. Sean Kelly for the chair of Caroline County Public School Board. The first nomination is Mr. Sean Kelly for chair of the Caroline County Public School Board. Are there any other nominations? Dr. Kelverick, I would ask that the nomination be closed on that name. Hearing no other nominations, may I have a motion to close nominations for chair? So moved. So, so moved. The motion was made by Mr. Taylor and seconded by Ms. Carson. Motion to approve the first nominee. May I please have a motion in support or in nomination for Mr. Kelly? I make a motion that we have nominate Mr. Kelly for chairman of the school board. I will second that motion. Any discussion? Point of order. We need to um, vote on the closing the nominations first. Thank you so much. So if we could call the roll. <laughs> Mr. Spalding? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Dr. rollins Fells. Aye. And now we can move forward with the. Thank you, Mrs. Stevens. May I have a motion to approve the first nominee, Mr. Sean Kelly, for chair of the Caroline County Public School Board? So moved, Madam Chair. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Stevens, please call for the vote. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Congratulations. At this time, I would like to congratulate our newly elected chair, Mr. Sean Kelly, and I pass on the gavel as a symbol of the duties and responsibilities that accompany this position. Our fellow board members pledge their support to you as chair as we move forward. We certainly look forward to working with you in anticipation of the leadership that you will provide to this board. The newly elected chair will continue with the reorganization of the board. Congratulations. Thank you. As, I don't know if you guys know this, but I got some really big shoes to fill. Uh, at this time, I would take nominations for the vice chair. 
I would like to nominate John Copeland for vice chair. I second. Are there any other nominations? I move that the nomination be closed on that name. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Motion to approve the first nominee. Oh, call for the vote to close the nominations for vice chair. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Rollins Spells? Aye. Motion to approve the nominee. So moved. Second. Please call for the vote. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Ron Spells? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Copeland. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, Mrs. Stevens, I would like to make a recommendation for the clerk of the board. I recommend Miss Lisa Stevens as clerk of the board. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Can you please call for the vote, Mrs. Stevens? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ron Spells? Aye. Mr. Spalding? I started to say nay, but I'll go <laughs> along with that. <laughs> I might approve. <laughs> Mr. Copeland? I don't know. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Taylor? Aye. Congratulations, Mrs. Stevens. <laughs> I would also like to make a recommendation at this time for Deputy Clerk of the Board. I recommend Ms. Terry Harrison as Deputy Clerk. May I have a motion? Motion to approve. Seconded by Mr. Spaulding, and may we call for the vote, please. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Spaulding? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. And we also need a superintendent's designee for 2023. I would like to nominate Dr. Herbert Monroe to serve in my absence. May I have a motion? So move. Include Herbert Monroe to alternate. Second. The motion was made by Mr. Copeland and seconded by Mr. Taylor. May we call for the vote, please? Mr. Spalding? I was thinking about it. <laughs> Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Carson? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. My final nomination for this evening is the student school board representative who will be introduced this evening. I would like to make a motion for Malayla Courtney to be the 2324 student school board representative. May I have a motion? So, so moved. That was a unanimous Jinx. so moved. <laughs> I am going to give that to Dr. Rollins Fells. May I have a second, please? Second. Mrs. Carson, thank you. Let's call for the vote for Malayla Courtney. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Kelly, you are up for board calendar 2023. Thank you. As has been the standard practice um, since we've been on the board, it's the second Monday. I'll read the dates for everyone just to be sure we're all on the same page. February the 13th, 2023, March 13th, April 10, May 8, June 12, July 10th. August 14, September 11, October 9, November 13, and December 11. And I will entertain a motion to approve those dates. So, so moved. Second. The motion has been made and seconded. Can we please call for the vote? Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Dr. Jawanda Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. At this time, I'll also entertain a motion to reaffirm the Code of Ethics for school board members and the Clerk Code of Ethics as specified in board policy. So moved, Ms. Matt, uh, Mr. Chairman. Second. <coughs> the, 
the motion has been made and properly seconded. Please call for the vote. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, could, sir. Before we go on, and I know this is out of order, but just before we go on, I, I want to say publicly, I want to thank Dr. Rollins Fells and our uh, assistant uh, chairperson for the great job that they have done over the year, not just last year, but over the years. It's a very difficult position, especially when you're the chairperson and you got to make me be quiet. So <laughs> I just want to say that uh, they did an excellent job. And, and, and not only them, I'm, I'm just proud of this board. We work together. We don't always agree, but we never leave without shaking hands and asking about our families and uh, because that's the, that's the relationship that we have. So I was going to say that at the, as my closing comments, but sometimes when we get to closing comments, most people are gone. <laughs> and I just want you to know what a fantastic person we had in Dr. Rollins Fells and the job that she did, the leadership that she showed, and I'm just appreciative for having been able to serve. And again, I apologize for breaking in the meeting, but I just wanted to say that. No, well, thank you, Ms. Kelly. Can we give her a round of applause for the wonderful leadership that she has provided? She's probably going to be breathing a sigh of relief, but she also knows that I'll be calling her pretty frequently. Um, and at this time, the next item on the agenda is the Mid-Year Overview Achieve 2027 with Dr. Monroe. Ms. Courtney, it is your time to please <laughs> join us up here. I think I can speak on behalf of the board, and I so we really look forward to having the voice in the school that we have definitely benefited from in the last two years since we have started this progress. And I know that this is going to be a learning curve for you, but there's a big generation gap, and we're, we rely on what you see and what you hear and your perspective and everything. So thanks in advance for the work that you are going to be doing with this board. Um, and one more time, mid-year overview, Achieve 2027, Dr. Monroe. Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Calvary, it is a plum pleasing pleasure for us this evening to celebrate all of the excitement that has occurred with Achieve 2027. It gives me great honor to do this tonight as a, as a team, as we have our Achieve Champions this evening. And we will give a high level overview of the successes for Goal 1, Teaching and Learning. Goal two, relationships. Goal three, health and safety. And goal four, talent management. The Achieve 2027 champions and I are celebrating all of the great success that we've had over the first semester in Achieve 2027, all things with excellence. Starting with goal one, teaching and learning begins with academic excellence. And we are excited about the approval of the Advanced African American Studies course, and we have all received raving reviews in semester one of the new cybersecurity and entrepreneur courses at Caroline High School, in addition to the theater arts pathway at Caroline Middle School. Our elementary schools have begun student-led conferences to enhance academic excellence and student self-efficacy, and CCPS was awarded the Head Start grant that will put VPI, Head Start, Title I, and ECSE 
all under one hashtag Caroline Preschool Umbrella, as we know that early intervention makes all the difference. We have expanded our academic and extracurricular programming through JA Heroes and the Teachers for Tomorrow program. These Caroline High School students work with fifth graders each quarter to model and teach lessons on social skills and express them and expose them to career and technical education opportunities. To ensure access to a multitude of academic and social interactions, CCPS also offered pop-up tutoring in five communities within Caroline County. We would also like to thank the Caroline Educational Foundation for providing two $1,000 scholarships and a $2,000 signing bonus annually for two students who complete their degree in education and return to CCPS to teach. These Teacher for Tomorrow students also assist and participate in our Summer Academy, our amazing Literacy and Math Nights, and wherever there is an opportunity to support teaching and learning which has expanded access and opportunity for all K-12 students. We continue to align our efforts with the CCPS profile of a graduate by having innovative hands-on experiential learning experiences. We've had amazing STEM expos and innovation fairs, and we are excited to announce that our newest project involves our building trade students constructing an entire home on site for a veteran in our community. At this time, I turn it over to Michelle Gonzalez to share a goal to successes. Thank you so very much, Dr. Monroe. I will be presenting some highlights for goal two, relationships. Subjective one is communication. We continue to, to strengthen and grow our communication platforms as CCPS launched its brand new and improved website a weekly electronic employee newsletter, The Insider, and created a CCPS alumni Facebook page that now has 800 followers. Subscribers to the monthly community electronic newsletter, The CCPS Express, also continues to grow. In order to foster community engagement, CCPS held its first annual Partners in Education Appreciation event in April 2022 held community kickball events around Caroline County in September, and is planning a community bingo night at several locations in the Caroline community on February 7th. For objective two, teacher-student partnerships. Teacher-student partnerships kicked off with CMS Multicultural Celebration Day. This event allowed CMS students to unite and collaborate across diverse cultures as they shared a dish with their fellow students specific to their heritage. It was a multicultural celebration that connected our CMS students with disabilities and our English language learners to create educational magic, learning about Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and other Latin cultures. Hashtag One Caroline is in effect with our Unity Days established quarterly, our fifth grade students visit CMS for creating connections and communicating with staff and peers through team building activities. And our Friday night lights, spirit nights at our football games were lots of fun. It was a great opportunity for students from each school to show their school pride and support our athletes as they join together on the track at halftime to cheer on their calves. And we even had some four-legged support from Meadows Farms. I know we all enjoyed seeing the horse there at our football games. And then objective three, partners in education. Events such as the community kickball game, the block party, CTE dinner, and board games for students could not have happened without our amazing partners in education. We continue to work to foster and strengthen our relationships with community partners to include businesses, organizations, and churches. Whether it's donations, facilities, providing work-based learning opportunities for our students, mentoring at our Promise students, or any other invaluable service our partners provide, we are grateful for them and will continue to, our, to expand our partnerships for CCPS. Next, we have Lindsay Rose with Goal 3, Health and Safety. Thank you. Good evening and thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. 
It is my pleasure to share the successes of goal three, which is health and safety. Health and safety begins with wellness, promoting physical and SEL well-being. CCPS has partnered with RACSB, Germana Community College, DSS, and building a community health improvement plan known as CHIP. CHIP is charged with providing mental health supports to schools and families, while also creating pathways to increase the number of mental health professionals in our region. To expand wellness opportunities for employees, we have provided flu shot clinics, retirement workshops, and frequently communi communicated the value of the many services provided by our employee assistance program. And within the past two weeks, the Parent Teacher Resource Center has partnered with Order Ahead for monthly food bank delivery for families at the Parent Teacher Resource Center office. CCPS is taking care of our students and employees physically and emotionally to be successful in school and in life. For goal 3.2, crisis prevention and preparedness. CCPS staff alongside with the CCSO department conducted an active intruder drill for its deputies at Caroline High School. This drill provided deputies with training in handling an intruder in, and intruder in the school setting. The CCSO collaborated with CCPS to hold a safety forum to discuss topics of concern from the community. Topics included safety procedures such as bullying, drills and threats, drug awareness and internet safety. The community safety forum was live streamed and a recording was posted on the for the community to review at their convenience. We are grateful for the collaboration and communication with the CCSO and together we are able to keep our students and employees safe. For goal three is facilities management. A huge kudos to our facilities and maintenance department for providing site improvements including fencing and for the CTE department at Caroline High School to enhance safety within the CTE program. The old tank at the well house was officially removed and the high, from the high school and our Lotus Academy received a bathroom renovation, which was a major update for that building. Next, we have Ms. Cindy Brown, who will present with goal four successes in talent management. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Talent management is our goal number four. Starting with objective 4.2, recruitment and retention. As you know, we are here to grow our own. Many of our CCPS employees have been enrolled in higher education programs with teaching positions to come. We're also very proud to have our partnerships with many different colleges to enhance our current teachers into even higher education. 4.26 is recognition and appreciation. As you know, Melanie Brown was recognized as our Teacher of the Year. And to come over the next month, we will be recognizing our support staff and Novice Teacher of the Year. We also are very proud to honor our Battlefield District Coaches of the Year, Dina Kepler from, for field hockey and Gerald Johnson for football. Objective 4.3, employee performance. Monitoring, mentoring, and coaching. Yes, we're very excited about our new teacher coaches that we have adopted this year. We have one for the elementary and also one for, the <clears throat> for their secondary. Our novice teachers from year, zero years experience to three years have the support of our new teacher coaches. With their teaching and their experiences, they provide for our new teachers the standards, ensuring their excellence, helping them to, to plan, providing feedback, observing, and then helping to improve their overall instructional practices. This has been a very, very useful tool this school year. In the area 4.4, compensation and benefits, we've just completed our pay point salary scale, and as you know, in the month of December, we offered $1,000 bonuses for all employees who had been contracted since September 1. So, this is one of our wonderful highlights and more to come as we move into the next semester. We are excited to continue our number one hashtag, One Caroline. Let's continue to do all things with ex excellence and make each day your masterpiece. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monroe, Ms. Gonzalez, Ms. Rose, and Ms. Brown. 
We're about to enter the recognition portion of our agenda. We enjoy having an opportunity to recognize staff, students, and community members. We ask that you remain seated until all recognitions are complete, and then the board will pause for a quick minute break for anyone that would like to dismiss. At this time, we would like to move on towards recognition of Virginia Principals Appreciation Week with Dr. Monroe. Great evening again, Chair Kelly, Vice, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Calvary. It is a great honor and privilege that Virginia Principals Appreciation Week was celebrated January 9th through the 13th. As we know, the role of the principal as the instructional leader of the school is critically important to ensure students are provided the opportunity to learn. So tonight, we encourage all citizens of Caroline County to continue to join us in thanking, recognizing, and celebrating how our building principals are truly our VIPs. As I call your name, please come forward to be recognized. First, we have Cynthia Hextall, the proud principal of Bowling Green Elementary School. Come on down, and let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Next, we have Mrs. Cindy Brown, the proud principal of Lewis and Clark Elementary School. <laughs> Miss Teresa Hicks, the proud principal of Madison Elementary School. <laughs> Mrs. Corinne Griggs, the proud principal of our Caroline Middle School. <laughs> and last but not least, Mr. Josh Juss, Caroline High School principal. Again, we thank our principals for all that they do because this is not a job for our principals. This is a lifestyle. These folks work 24 seven. They never sleep. They're always thinking about their students and staff. And we're so proud of the work that they do with our employees as well as our students. At this time, can we give them one more round of applause? We would also like our Director of Elementary Schools, Mrs. Haley, and our Director of Secondary, Dr. Reed, to come forward for the picture. Thanks again to all the administrators and all the hours and hours of work that you guys do for our students. Uh, moving on to recognition of the 23-24 Student School Board representative with Dr. Craig Reed. Chairman Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Calvert. Good evening. I'm pleased to introduce the new school board representative for the 2023 school year, Mrs. Malayla Courtney. Ms. Courtney is currently a junior at Caroline High School. Ms. Courtney has exemplified leadership in a number of activities within Caroline High School and in the community. She is a member of the Caroline High School varsity cheerleading team. She also plays volleyball and tennis. In addition, she has served on the SCA and she is a member of BETA. Ms. Courtney plans to attend Virginia Tech to study anesthesiology. As the new student school board representative, she is also eager to be a voice for all students. As such, she will be speaking about highlight, highlights from each Caroline County Public School during school board meetings on a monthly basis. Caroline County Public Schools is excited about Ms. Courtney's new role as the student school board representative. At this time, I ask that we welcome Ms. Courtney and please give her a round of applause. We would love to invite the school board to come in front of the table with Maleva so we can have our first formal group photo with our new student school board representative. So if we can just remain right here on stage, that would be fabulous.
Thank you. Thank you. At this time, uh, we will move on to Superintendent Art Student of the Month with Dr. Calvaric. Good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, and members of the board. Exposure to art is critical to the development of every child. Art teachers, or excuse me, art not only teaches students how to express themselves in creative and individual ways, but students who participate in regular art-related activities perform better academically, develop greater confidence, and sharpen their fine motor skills. Beyond these benefits, art education promotes problem solving, critical thinking, perseverance, growth mindset, collaboration, focus, and accountability. All power skills CCPS graduates need to be 3E ready, enrolled, enlisted, and or employed. In cooperation with Caroline County Public School art teachers, I have the honor to recognize one student each month with a certificate of honor for their individual artwork. The student's art will be on display at the school board office for the remainder of the month, and I promise we will keep it safe. Mrs. Jennifer Harrelson, art teacher from Madison Elementary School, will now come forward to introduce the January 2023 recipient of the Superintendent Student Art Honor, Darius Jones. Ms. Har Harrison and Mr. Mr. Darius Jones, please come forward to the podium at this time. Thank you. Ms. Harrelson could not be here this evening, so I will share about Darius's art project. Um, Darius is a second grade student, and they are learning about 3D shapes as well as reviewing patterns. Um, Ms. Harrelson combined these two skills together to have the students create a feast. The students used paper and tape to form the 3D food shapes and then covered these shapes with paper mache to harden them. The students then wove an AB pattern tablecloth and glued the platter of food on top. Darius thrived in his 3D shape making. He was enjoying the paper mache um, aspect so much that he worked up until the very last minute putting those final touches on. He is a very creative boy and a very amazing artist, Darius Jones. Thank you, and that was absolutely wonderful to see. Uh, we will now move on to item D, recognition of Lotus Academy, going back to Dr. Herb Monroe. Chairman Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Kelverick, it is truly a heartwarming honor to announce that the staff of our Lotus Academy has been named the 2023 VASCD Impact Leadership Team of the Year. We can applaud, we can applaud. <laughs> I just want to share briefly that the Lotus Academy truly works with our most at promise students to ensure that our students are successful in school and in life by every day making sure that our students understand that overcoming obstacles, building resilience, and empowering learners is truly the way to make a difference on our planet. So at this time, I would like to call those staff persons that serve at our Lotus Academy, as they just have an amazing way of sometimes making our underdogs the top dogs. So with that being said, I would like Conchetta Green to come forward, please. She's in the audience today. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Calvert. <laughs> We'd like Brittany Reinhardt to come forward, please, if she's here this evening. <laughs> we would like Sean 
Cavallo to come forward. Is Sean here this evening? Come on up, Sean. <laughs> Next, we have Hannah Heflin. Is Hannah in the house tonight? Didn't make it tonight, that's okay. She's probably out taking some kids home and traveling and checking on folks, right? Next, we have uh, Mr. Doris Little. Please come forward. We also have Kevin Collins. Please come forward. I'm gonna beat this next guy in a round of chest. Uh, can we have Antonio Klingscales come forward? <laughs> next we have Deborah Coleman. Mrs. Coleman, come on down. The price is right. <laughs> And last but not least, um, I really would like to say that this last person leads with her heart, and she truly does hard work. The time that she spends making sure that she and her team educates the entire child has truly been amazing. And um, I would really like to thank her, and we would all like to thank Mrs. Darlene Keener for her leadership at the Lotus Academy. Once again, I'd like Dr. Reed and Mrs. Haley to come forward. And while we're getting ready for the picture, uh, this staff will be honored at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. For the first time, they will be able to sit down and eat lunch as adults. And uh, they will be honored by distinguished educators throughout the Commonwealth. So can we give them one more round of applause? Thank you very much and congratulations everyone. Thank you and congratulations. Moving on to item E, Mentor Appreciation Month with Mr. Jeff Wick. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Kelly, Vice Chair, Mr. Copeland. Rest of the school board and Dr. Kelverick. Hold on, I lost my spot here. Okay, January is Mentor Recognition Month. And tonight I would like to recognize those who have volunteered for the inaugural year for the CCPS Mentor Program. I have to say we're off to a great start. <laughs> we are having a very successful program up to this point. I would like to extend the appreciation of the school board as well as the schools to those individuals who have dedicated time twice a month to work with the CCPS student. Their commitment has allowed our program to become successful as they provide a beneficial service and a positive relationship to CCPS students. For those mentors who are able to attend tonight, please come forward when your name is called. And, and since we have a decent audience here, as well as those online, I would like to put a plug in for the mentor program. We are always seeking mentors, so please uh, volunteer. You can go to our website, ccps.us, and find the mentor link there. Uh, so I will call the names. If you're here, please please come forward. Well, up front, we already have Dr. Kel Varick. She's mentoring one of our students. Uh, Ashley Camp. Nancy Carson, Beverly Copeland, Lisa Gaddy, Julie Gibson, Lance Jeter, Ronnie Mongold, Dr. Monroe, Jennifer Rawls, Scott Richards, Martha Samuel, Taria Shepard, 
Christy Shaw. Kaylee Shortridge. And Lisa Stevens. I also want to thank the mentors for coming tonight to be recognized. And please give, give these men and women a nice round of applause for their service. <laughs> I do want to thank you guys once again and let you know that there's also a small gift coming here in the near future to you guys for, for what you're doing for our students. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Wick. At this time, we'll move on to item F, second quarter A, B, C, D award with Ms. Karen Foster. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, Dr. Cal Varick. I am so excited to be here this evening to recognize staff who were nominated for and who are being recognized for the second quarter above and beyond the Call of Duty awards, or simply the ABCD awards. The ABCD Award recognizes all employees who go above and beyond the call of duty in performing their job responsibilities. Employees include teachers, administrators, support staff, office professionals, instructional assistants, nurses, nutrition services, transportation, and maintenance. Once nominated, nominees are evaluated on one or more of the following criteria. They've made a significant contribution that improved job efficiency, improve the quality of services, improve safety, or conserved resources, as well as performing a humanitarian or hu heroic act, responded proactively by anticipating needs and solving problems without specific direction. This second quarter, we had over two dozen nominees again. There are great things being done throughout the county, so it was very difficult for the panel that went through all of the nominations. But this evening, the first recipient of our ABCD award is Megan McReynolds. Megan, if you wanna join us while I read what Mrs. Hale wrote about you. Mrs. McReynolds is a fourth grade teacher as well as the PBIS chairperson at Bowling Green Elementary where she plans for monthly school-wide events for PBIS reinforcement. This year, Mrs. McReynolds started a mentoring project with my fourth grade students who have disabilities after seeing a need when there was a bullying incident. Her students come and read books to my students. During this time, they also answer comprehension questions with their partner. Additionally, Mrs. McReynolds has asked my students to come to her class for more time in order to facilitate social emotional growth in her students, which also provides social skills growth social skills growth for my students with special needs. The fact that Mrs. McReynolds and I are able to plan for more time for our students is as exceptional as she is going above and beyond the duty. Let's give a round of applause for Mrs. McReynolds. Next, if we could have Missy Heinball or Melissa Heinball come on down. Missy works for our CCPS maintenance department. Before I even read, you can tell by the round of applause, everyone knows Missy. So Holly Riggins wrote, Melissa is always working on something above and beyond the call of duty for our school division. Whether it's painting entire buildings or schools by herself, that's true. Filling in to cut and landscape our schools. She flies like a race car driver. Changing filters, helping with plumbing issues, cleaning out and organizing the maintenance shops, moving items for other staff, coming in early or staying late if needed. She takes initiative to get the job done. Melissa is often seen picking up trash off of school properties and playground without being asked or directed to help keep our schools clean and safe for our students and staff. 
Constantly working, she asks if anyone needs help, providing with them with the assistance needed. Melissa is a dedicated and very hardworking employee that deserves recognition as she goes above and beyond the call of duty every day. Congratulations, Missy. Wonderful, and hopefully this is a surprise for one of our um, honorees in the audience. Our next honoree is Margaret Bryant. Come on down. <laughs> Dr. Bryant was nominated not once, but twice, one by Vicki Washington and one by Joey Rob Robinson, who wrote, Dr. Bryant wears many hats in the division. Not only does she perform her duties as the coordinator of virtual learning and innovation, she is also deeply involved in organizing, writing, and submitting grants. She has a vision that improves the quality of services to our students and responds proactively by anticipating needs and problem solving without direction. Dr. Bryant has assisted our innovation specialist at the high school, who as a result was awarded a $5,000 grant from Dominion Energy for a greenhouse. This project will extend teaching and learning opportunities outside of the classroom as, per, as well as provide some real world cross-curricular opportunities. Recently, she has taken a lead in tackling a robust 21st century grant application. Without missing a beat, she organized a team to support her and reached out to our community for inclusion in the project. Dr. Bryant has been successful in managing these projects and other that are similar while continuing to perform her primary job responsibilities with innovation and virtual learning. Dr. Bryant continues to have a can-do attitude and provide the best educational opportunities for our students. Dr. Bryant is more than worthy to receive this ABCD award recognition and I ask you to join us in a round of applause. And on our final slide, you will see honorable mention and congratulations for all of our second quarter ABCD nominees from Bowling Green Elementary, from Caroline High School, Caroline Middle, Lewis and Clark, a slew from Madison Elementary, Lotus Academy, trans and two from Transportation. All of these nominees will receive their nomination through the inner office mail so they are able to keep that for their portfolio as well as put that with their resume. So please uh, join me in congratulating all of our nominees from all areas within the division. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. This time as promised, uh, we will pause for a quick minute break for anyone that would like to dismiss. We will reconvene at 6.30 when we start our budget hearing as advertised.
Thank you. At this time, um, as advertised, we will move on uh, for Dr. Calvaric and Marcia Stevens, and I was told Karen Foster uh, for our budget hearing for FY24. Ms. Stevens, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Calvaric. Um, Dr. Calvaric, Karen Foster, Mrs. Foster, and I are pleased to be with you this evening to introduce the FY24 budget priorities for the school board budget public hearing. Our objectives tonight are as follows, to go over budget content, to look at our budget priorities, and hold our CCPS FY24 budget public hearing. The CCPS budget development process is deliberate, aligned, inclusive, and transparent, familiar with various internal and external factors that were considered when developing this budget will heighten your understanding of the FY24 priorities. This year, CCPS principals and department heads submitted 47 budget requests, each aligned to an achieved 2027 strategic plan goal or objective. To evaluate and prioritize each request, numerous superintendent committees, the budget advisory, senior staff, and the school board reviewed and categorized each of these items into mandatory critical need, needs, or wants. Additionally, to seek further stakeholder engagement, CCPS invited parents, students, staff, and community members to respond to the FY24 budget survey released in December. 717 responses were received, with 48.1% of the respondents being employees, and 58.9% of the respondents identified as parents and families, students, and community members. 121 open feedback comments were also reviewed and carefully considered. Because the Code of Virginia requires school divisions to develop a needs-based budget, these data points were paired with the additional CCPS analytics to identify the top 10 priorities most relevant to the school division's current and future needs. Ms. Foster will now join us and guide us through the FY24 budget priorities, beginning with compensation. Priority one, employee compensation is essential to attracting and retaining high quality staff to support instruction and school operations. In the midst of an employee critical shortage, compensation continues to be a national, state, and local prior priority. With 700 CCPS employees, the school division will outline the cost associated with the proposed $5 million compensation increase outlined within the recently completed 2023 Paypoint HR Comprehensive Study. Annually, as part of our budget process, CCPS examines where teacher salaries fall compared to regional competitors. Historically, Caroline County Public Schools has ranked 14 out of 16 for zero to five year salaries. However, despite the school division funding a 7% salary increase in the current fiscal year, CCPS fell to 15 to 16 for the 22-23 school year with ex Essex moving ahead of Caroline. Noteworthy on this slide is Paypoint HR's additional like-sized Dinwiddie County Schools as a pay study comparator. Not unlike the outcome in the 2018 pay study, the 2022 pay study indicates our continued challenge that CCPS experiences when competing with our 16 neighboring recruitment competitors. CCPS salaries rank 16 out of the 17 divisions for zero years of experience and 15 of 17 for five years of experience when compared to Chesterfield, Culpeper, Dinwiddie, Essex, Fredericksburg, Goochland, Hanover, Henrico, King and Queen, King George, King William, Louisa, Orange, Richmond, Spotsylvania, and Stafford. Only King and Queen counties fall below our zero years of experience in salaries. Take note when comparing CCPS teachers who are at their fifth year this year teaching, our teachers make less than teachers with zero years experience in 14 of the listed regional counties. 
On this so slide, you will see a breakdown of salaries associated with all employee classifications. This slide shows the education support and administrative scales. These include all employees who are not teacher on the teacher scale within the division. Based upon PayPoint HR's analysis of the external market comparison, you will see that 51% of employees are considered below market, 43 are near market, and very few employees are considered above market. None of those who are above market are on the administrative scale, and less than 1% of the employees are in the top 20% of the salary scale, meaning the division is not top heavy with respect to compensation. The recommendation for FY23 compensation in study includes three different areas of implementation. Step one study recommended FY23 adjustments to teachers on steps zero to 16 to have a starting salary of $48,695. The recommendation will cost approximately $400,000. Step two of the implementation would be to place all employees in the recommended scales from PayPoint HR during the FY24 at the cost of a, at approximately $2.8 million. Step three, Governor Yonkin has recommended a 5% increase for SOQ positions. CCPS proposes that 5% increase for all employees and will cost approximately $1.8 million, which brings our total cost of full implementation of the FY23 salary study, in addition to the governor's proposed increase, is approximately $5 million. At this time, I'd like to, not yet, sorry. Our second priority is healthcare insurance. While local choice health insurance renewal is expected mid to late February, our health insurance consultant's review of CCPS's claims data is estimated at a 10% increase, which equates to an employer cost of approximately $606,000. While insurance premium rates adjusted vary from year to year, our past seven-year average increase has been 4.91% from 2017 to 2023. At this time, I will pass to Dr. Kalverick to review our position and technology requests. Our next two priorities are two behavioral specialists, one for general education and one for special education. The special education behavioral specialist position is an existing FTE or full-time equivalent, which is currently funded by expiring grant monies. The second behavioral specialist FTE or full-time equivalent request reflects the increasing general education behavioral needs across the K-12 continuum. A wide array of data, including increased discipline referrals and a marked increase in risk slash threat assessments are driving the need for a general education position focused on positive behavioral intervention supports, supportive of students, staff, and families. Coordinator of Student Support Services. A coordinator of student support services will serve as the division-wide anchor for all student services and related staff. Duties and responsibilities include oversight of all school counselors, all 504 plans, positive behavioral interventions and supports, also known as PBIS, Virginia tiered systems of support, known as VTSS, mental health services and partnerships in the community, social emotional learning, character education, various professional learning, such as trauma-informed care, growth mindset, and restorative justice practices. It should be known that this position at $116,999 is inclusive of all benefits for a 12-month coordinator. Special Education Teacher. 
An additional special education teacher is needed to address classroom and caseload capacity for self-contained core classes and collaborative and resource classrooms. Additionally, a new FTE or full-time equivalent would enable CHS to further expand resource course offerings which provide direct support of each child's individualized goals within the written IEP or individualized education plan. Instructional assistance. Since the opening of the 22-23 school year, Caroline County Public Schools have observed a sizable increase in the number of students with special needs the division is serving. Specifically, the division has moved five, from 545 students with disabilities to 616 as of January 2023. Of the 71 student increase, 37 are at the elementary level. Three special education paraprofessionals have been requested and they would support the growing population and provide instructional and behavioral support. Replacement cycle student devices. CCPS student devices are covered by a three year warranty. Upon expiration of the warranty, the device, typically a Chromebook or an iPad, is eligible for the replacement cycle. To ensure students have access to updated functional equipment and software, it is critical for the annual replacement cycle to be fully funded. Currently, the school division receives $180,000 in annual VPSA technology grant funding. However, the annual cost is $456,000. An effort to remain true to the annual replacement cycle of one, one third of the division's student service devices, a budget request of $276,000 will be needed. Change part-time custodians to full-time. Goal three of Achieve 2027 Health and Safety reflects the critical importance of wellness and facility maintenance. Our Custodial staff is essential to the establishment and maintenance of a healthy and safe teaching, learning, and working environment. CCPS has currently 31 part-time custodians, of which one-third has remained vacant and or turned over during the 22-23 school year. Due to the school division's difficulty with, an empl with employing and retaining part-time custodians, the school division proposed the absorption of hours from 11 part-time positions to convert the remaining 20 to full-time. The reduction of FTEs partnered with an increased full-time hours will support the existing square footage staffing allocations. This transition will support the recruitment and retention of staff due to increased salary, health insurance access, Virginia retirement system benefits, and full-time hours at a cost of $362,707. Work-based learning teacher. For the first time this year, the state accreditation process will include a new accreditation criteria called College and Career Readiness Index, also known as CCRI. CCRI reflects the number of students taking advanced placement and or dual enrollment courses, students earning CTE credentials or certifications, and students engaged in any of the 12 work-based learning experiences defined by the Virginia Department of Education, such as apprenticeships, internships, externships, job shadowing, etc. The work-based learning teacher would coordinate work-based workplace experiences that are related to students' career goals and or interests connected to a course and performed in partnership with local businesses and organizations. These opportunities require strategic course planning, extensive paperwork, and coordinated efforts with community business partners, institutions of higher learning, and regional agencies to ensure the opportunities align with the learning experiences recognized by the DOE. Please note again that this work-based learning teacher as well as all other positions outlined this evening are fully loaded with all benefits. So to summarize our FY24 budget priorities, total $6.4 million. We're only looking at the expenditure side of these priorities at this time. Compensation is five million, health insurance premium 606,000, positions of 560,000, and technology replacement of 276. 
As we have outlined the FY24 preliminary budget priorities based on the feedback from our community and employees, I will end with today's quick recap with what is your specific budget passion point. We would like to thank everyone for their participation tonight in the public hearing and also would like to um, ask Chair Kelly to open the FY24 budget hearing and this is on the operational budget. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. At this time, we will open the floor up for anyone that would like to make comments regarding our budget. Sir, once you get to the podium, please state your name. Good evening, everybody. My name is Travis Clark. Nice to see everybody. Um, so this is going to be a little odd because uh, I'm talking about myself, but this is in relation to the activities director position that is on the budget request for next year for Caroline Middle School. Um, my name is Travis Clark. I'm currently a health and PE teacher as well as an athletic director for Caroline Middle School. I've been a teacher in this county since the beginning of this year. However, I've served as the AD since February of last year. Um, in this time, I've seen many opportunities. I've seen opportunities that need improvement. I've seen opportunities that need change. I've seen opportunities that need emergence. But more import importantly, I've seen opportunities to help. Since coming on board, the imagination and the ability to, to cultivate a younger generation has far been exceeded. I've been able to bring new activities, new ideas, new culture to the school's athletics pro program, instilling a culture of school pride, maintaining an ac academic and excellence expectation from our student athletes to have them 3D ready by the time they reach Caroline High School. I've helped to start the foundation for our student athletes to find their own identity and be proud to call what is theirs. Um, Caroline Middle had 13 sports when I got here. With the addition of swim and volleyball, we will be at 15 sports next year. We have countless clubs that are established and in the making and the endless possibilities to add more, to reach more of the student body. In relation to surrounding counties, or surrounding county middle schools is anywhere from three to eight more opportunities for the kids that we offer in Caroline County. A little over two thirds of our school is involved with a club or after school activity with over one third of that number coming strictly from athletics. Our involvement is up 200% since last year. Kids are excited about extracurriculars. They feel a sense of ownership and pride in the school. I have included practice teams to capture more students that play three to four games a year. Involvement of NJHS, other clubs to help with volunteer hours, marketing, and fundraising with student engagement, student national anthems, partnerships with groups in our county like our beloved restaurants, the Moose Lodge, Caroline Community Foundation, established several rising sixth grade meetings and mentorships to help with the retention and betterment for our future Eagles. I helped to kickstart the eighth period after school groups with the YMCA for kids that need the extra care and the extra help. Getting small businesses involved with highlighting them at a lot of our games and marketing through our sport and activity, create a sense of pride in the school halls and have made student athlete leaders in the short time that have been a part of C uh, CMS. Um, just 12 months ago, we did not have all these practices in place for our school body. A lot of the kids were lost. They did not feel this type of pride or accountability. They were not leader ready before getting to the high school. This whole process allows for a brighter future in Caroline schools. The approval um, of this position would allow for advisory groups for athletic support and student athlete mentorship school-wide. It allows for the continuation of facility enhancements. It allows for a more student athlete centered campus where the behavior and academic progress is shown as a highlight. It allows for the addition of having someone more certified for injury care after school, the addition for administrative support, and most importantly, the relationships that are made from student to student, student to teacher, and student to community. Our community needs this. Our board asked to help bridge gaps between schools. They asked to give opportunities to community, family, and student bodies. They asked to seek safe and secure locations for mental health safer schools and safer communities. I believe I am the tape that is done and will continue to do this for the sake of the Caroline County and a future generation of our kids. I bring this up for many reasons. 
where there are numerous positions available at the next level to aid with this, there's not down at the middle school level. Our kids need to be reached at this level. Renovations and upkeep to our fields and facilities, scheduling, behavior and grade progress reports, being on site, site for basic first aid responsibilities, eligibility checks, budgeting, organizing, marketing, communicating, ex, uh, expecting, and most importantly, leading. It takes countless hours to maintain these programs, as I'm sure you guys are aware. Um, but on top of the countless hours of lesson planning, VTSS, and other group specific responsibilities, attending meetings, modifying, grading, communicating that it takes to teach as well, that's everything that I'm consuming this year. All this while balancing a new family, commuting two hours from an entry teacher position with a stipend smaller than some assistant coaches at the high school level make. Again, I respect any decision that is made and will continue to do what is needed to make the school activities exceed the CCPS pathway. The possibilities are endless when the right person is in place. I think I've found my home and this helps encourage the support I get from the school staff, students, and community. Thank you. Are there any other citizens in the audience that would make like to make comments? Yes, sir. Please state your name. Good evening. My name is Nick Raymer Stevens, and I am the band director here at Caroline Middle School. Um, I come to you this evening with a request to allocate more money towards our music and arts programs here at the middle school. As some of you may have seen or heard from our winter concert, we have had quite a lot of success in the growth of our numbers as well as the quality of sound. However, given our success thus far, we still have some steps to take in order to be a fully equipped band program. As Dr. Calaveric mentioned earlier, it is critical uh, for the arts to be a part of the students' growth and development. Well, in my five years of teaching here at Caroline Middle, my mission with the band program has been to develop our creativity and critical thinking through playing music. In the year 2020, the Virginia Department of Education sought to rework the learning standards for more technical components such as scales and chords into more overarching themes of focusing on the creative process, which has helped immensely in the music and performing arts. However, in order for us here at CMS to fully reflect these standards, we need to meet some certain requirements. In order to be a fully equipped band program, we still need to acquire two large instruments for our percussion section. This way our students can explore the creative process and play all genres within the band repertoire. The instruments include a marimba and a vibraphone, which will cost an estimated $4,500 collectively. Additionally, the band is in need of funds to repair and replace its current instrument inventory that has either been purchased in years past or donated by previous band students and parents. Every year I've taught here at CMS, about a third to almost half my students have always had to rent instruments from my band program as opposed to renting from our local music shops. And this is usually due to the fact many students come from these low income families that can't afford the high quality instruments offered at music shops. Um, most of these instruments that have been owned or purchased in the past are not of the best quality and therefore not in best condition, some of which are beyond repair and we are in need of this new inventory. Between the cost of repairs for current instruments and ones that need to be replaced entirely, this would cost an estimated ten to $15,000. As our program continues to grow, and especially with the possibility of two elective courses next year, our intention is to grow our program so that we, we have a well-rounded education for our students in the arts so they can reach their full potential in their creative process and critical thinking. I ask you here tonight that you hopefully grant $20,000 to the band program for the next year's budget for our years to come so therefore we can broaden the minds of our future generations of students thank you thank you is there any are there any other citizens of the audience who would like to make a comment regarding the budget thank you ma'am please state your name my name is Laura Marks and I'm from Western Caroline. The reason I'm here tonight um, to speak on regards to the budget is for the last couple of years, um, the athletic department at, <coughs> at, um, sorry, at Caroline High School has received a $40,000 budget out of a $68,000 school budget that you guys have. And uniforms have not been purchased in four years for the football team. Shoulder pads have not been purchased in four years for the football team. For the last two seasons, the football team has been wearing white uniforms that have holes all in them with pads hanging out. 
and due to a fundraiser I put online about a month ago, it brought the attention to some of our school board members and where we were raising money. Uh, I'm with the Caroline Cavalier Football Club too, by the way. Um, we were raising money for new uniforms for these children, so they look appropriate when they go to away games. Um, I was told just this past week that um, Caroline High School will be purchasing the white uniforms and our school and our club has purchased, it will be purchasing the other two uniforms um, that the coaches need as well. Um, so what we have discovered with talking with the high school is that a $40,000 budget just isn't simply enough. Prior to 2022, Mr. Heiser was um, scrambling, wondering how he was gonna even pay his officials. Not until this year, when we started getting gate money, did he actually have enough to pay everybody and do everything he's supposed to do with that athletic budget. With an athletic budget of $40,000, he is supposed to purchase uniforms, upkeep of the field, paint, officials, security at the gate, everything and with the price increase nowadays and inflation forty thousand dollars just isn't enough anymore and i think our athletic department really needs to be looked at as far as possibly bumping it up to fifty five thousand we did speak with um with people in the school and they do feel that they could comfortably run the athletic department at chancellor high school with fifty five thousand dollars a year and that would be cycling every year, getting new uniforms for all the sports, not just one. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else um, in the audience that would like to make a comment regarding the budget? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to make a comment regarding the budget? Hearing none, at this time we We'll close that portion and we will move back into our regular scheduled agenda for information from the district. And that is, let's see, item 6A, announcement core value of the month of February. Ms. Young? Good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair uh, Copeland, um, members of the board, and Dr. Kalvarik. This month, January, although it's almost ha completely over, the students and staff are de demonstrating the core value of community. Engagement is the core value for February, where we, we will focus on the five C's in the classroom to ensure students are all 3E ready, enrolled, enlisted, and employed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. And I also wanted to uh, apologize for not thanking everyone who came up and spoke during public comments. I know that it is, uh, there's a little bit of pressure when you gotta speak in front of people. So thank you for everyone who did come up here and make your comments heard. Um, at this point, we'll move on to item B, chronic absenteeism and Mr. Wick. Good evening, Chair, Mr. Kelly, Vice Chair, Mr. Copeland, rest of the school board and Dr. Kalvarik. I have with me tonight several social workers, um, Ms. Jeffer, school social workers, Ms. Jeffer from Caroline Middle School and Ms. Dixon from Madison Elementary. And with chronic absenteeism, again being included in the determination of school accreditation, this brief presentation will provide the school board with information on the three levels of accreditation related to absenteeism, what is used in its calculation, a review of data from this year and strategies being implemented to address chronic absenteeism. There are three accreditation levels of chronic absenteeism as can be seen on the screen and these are calculated by school. To achieve level one, zero to 15 percent of students can be chronically absent, which means they've missed 10 percent or more school days. For level two, 16 to 24 percent of students can be chronically absent and level three indicates that one quarter or more of the students in a school have reached the chronically absent threshold also a school can shift from level three to level two 
or from level two to level one if it experiences a 10% decrease from the previous year. However, that rule is not in place for this year. Okay, they've taken that away and that will be reinstated next year. For example, when that does happen, if a school was at 20% in year one, it would be at level two. If it reduced its rate to 18% in year two, the school would then be at level one, if that makes sense. Although the 18 still technically falls in level two. Uh, lastly, a school would fall into level three if it, were, if it were at levels two or three for four consecutive years. So if a school, for example, was between 16 and 24% for four straight years, it would shift to level three after the fourth year. <clears throat> as far as calculating chronic absenteeism, a student is chronically absent, again, just to repeat, if he or she misses 10% or more of the school year. All absences are counted in chronic absenteeism. This includes excused absences, unexcused absences, medical appointments, court, vacation, death in the family, etc. Furthermore, out of school suspension is also included in the calculation. For students who transfer, they are included if they attended the school for 50% or more of the school year. This does not have to be consecutive days. So it includes students who start the year in a CCPS school, transfer out, and then re-enroll later in the school year if all those days accumulate to 50% or more. Students who receive home-based or homebound instruction are not included in chronic absenteeism. So this chart on this slide shows you our current accreditation numbers. Actually, that's as of January 11th. And I picked uh, that day as the latest day because that was day 90. So nine absences equals 10%. So any student with nine or more absences is included in this percentage. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my comments here. So once again, the 22-23 the, the chronic absenteeism rate will be the sole determinant of chronic absenteeism performance for, the, for this school year going into next year. So to reach level two, which is where we want to be, the schools must reach 24%. So you can see where we are at each school. Several are close to 24. A couple are not, but they are working diligently to get that number down. <clears throat> A number of strategies are being used by the schools to encourage attendance. Shoot, I was supposed to pass this to Ms. Jeffers, so I'm gonna pass it to her now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so a number of strategies are being used by the schools. Um, one is sending letters home to the uh, parents when the student missed three, five, 10, or 12 days. Um, phone calls are being made, and morning check-ins are being conducted. Meetings and attendance plans are being developed to address individual students who are uh, absent and chronic absent. Um, during those, de those meetings, when we develop a attendance improvement plan meeting, <laughs> um, we also look at uh, resources that the student might need. Some, some families re refer to FAP, the social services, or the Rappahannock Community Service Board, or they need other resources like attendance work websites. Um, the so school social workers and the counselors address also mental health needs to short-term counseling and the family engagement specialist also in addresses the physical needs like clothing or food or the hygiene products. Um, the school overall tries to create a positive atmosphere to increase the sense of belonging with positive relationships is a really important point. Home visits are being conducted if it's feasible. A weekly or monthly data review to monitor changes in the data individual classrooms and grade level incentives at the elementary and middle school level, and last but not least, when all intervention are failing, um, an affidavit is being filed in court. Um, <coughs> and the school social workers are presenting the attendance case in court and then provide case management for court audit services. <coughs> So at this time, uh, we are glad to answer any questions you may have regarding chronic absenteeism. Yes, I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have a couple. Uh, student parents counseling, what brings that on? 
Your question is what brings on the counseling portion? How far does it have to get before you have that meeting? Well, we want to get to, according to the attendance policy, we send out letters, like she was saying earlier, at three, five, and seven days. So it really depends where you are in the school year. So if a student's getting close to 10%, I mean, we have a student at nine right now. Um, they're at 10%, so counseling is, is beginning right away. Once, once we notify the students, they have that first attendance plan, that's technically the counseling is beginning to encourage parents to send their students to school, help them understand how many days they've missed, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and put some things in place, as Ms. Jefferson was alluding to, maybe they need something at home, maybe they need help with hygiene, whatever we can do to help them out to keep them coming to school. So it starts very early. How hard is that to get the, uh, get the parents to get into this? Okay, <laughs> Ms. Dixon said very hard. Well, what, I don't understand. If it's very hard, how are we doing our job? I wasn't planning on speaking, but I will, surely. Um, so I think it really depends. I work at Madison, so of course I'm dealing with elementary school students, whereas Ms. Jeffers working at the middle school, and of course those are different years. Sometimes, you know, you're still relying on parents, of course, getting school, kids to school, but some of them are certainly old enough to get themselves up and out and that sort of thing. But I think particularly at the elementary school level, you know, you really do have to, you know, get not only buy-in from the student, although it's not a eight-year-old's responsibility really to get themselves to school. Not that is really, really the no. parent. Um, so when you talk about counseling, it's not counseling in the um, traditional term. It's really sitting down with parents and seeing what is the reason that you know the child isn't coming to school. Is it something to do with the parents themselves? Is it the student is having some issues at school? So it's it's looking at you know the reasons why. Um, I think, too, um, at least from an elementary standpoint, too, you know, we're really trying to work with the family. We don't want to come from a punitive standpoint. You know, court is the last place we want to end up. We end up there, certainly, but that's very punitive. And you're, you know, we talk a lot about building relationships with families and with our students. And, you know, the first thing, if, you, if they hear court right away, they, they, that destroys the relationship there, even if they realize that we're trying to help a student. We want the students in school to be educated, obviously. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fine dance is what it is. You know, we have the policy that we have to adhere to, but if we see that the parents are making progress or they are trying, but there's a lot of different uh, roadblocks, you know, we're gonna work with them, you know? So, um, like I said, it's a little bit of a dance sometimes, depending, you have to take every student and every family individually because they all come from different places and they have uh, different situations, so. I, I understand that fully. Okay. But uh, what about your home visits? Um, so what specifically, I mean, I think it, it, it just. Well, if you can't get a parent to come to school, mm -hmm and the child doesn't come to school, mm -hmm. don't you have to go home to see what's going on? Um, we, we have, certainly. Um, at times, sometimes, um, parents aren't there. That's what we, we offer. If they don't want to come to the school, we certainly go to them, meet them where they are. Um, but that's not always an effective tool either. You know, all, it, Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It just really depends. A lot of our folks are working. You know, um, We're not always able to get them. We Again, it's a lot of a... I don't want to say a dance, but it's a lot of trial and error of, of, of leaving notes, um, if you know, le leaving leaving letters with please call the school or we'll stop back, you know, uh, whatever day. So it's like I said, there's no real one size fits all for for students. I understand that fully, but I noticed that the two worst uh, absentees were the two elementary school, mm -hmm. and I, that kind of surprises me because mm -hmm. elementary kids want to go to school. If it had been the high school, mm -hmm. I could understand it. Sure. Well, uh, and let me just say, and I mean, for those who are familiar with chronic absenteeism, the thing is, there's a difference between truancy, which is, you know, your, your unexcused absences, but chronic absenteeism takes into consideration, just like what Mr. Wick was saying, you know, approved vacations, you know, f um, funerals, you know, unfortunately that falls under, is, you know, court. Um, excuse absences, yeah. everybody gets sick, and we have no control over those situations. We know that with COVID and all the other, you know, extenuating circumstances that we've had, we've had a lot of sickness, a lot of 
you know, just a lot of health issues. Uh. And so all of that falls under, you know, when our youngest ones a lot of times have been, I, I can't speak to the middle and the high school, but we have been hit really hard with on a, uh, honest, you know, sickness. And so that um, is an excused absence. So from a truancy standpoint, that's, we're not looking at that. We cannot control whether or not students are sick, though. You know, yeah. the number of, you know, doctor's notes in, or, or, or ER visits or excused absences, that all falls under this chronic absenteeism number. And so that is bigger than, you know, Caroline County Schools. That's bigger than, you know, that's, that's something that the entire state is, is. Well, my only point is, I don't want any kids falling through the cracks. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and I think that's what we're trying to avoid it, but it's very challenging. I mean, especially, we're trying to help the parents understand that a lot of doctor's visits does add up to chronic absenteeism. Right. And I mean, that's why the state gives you a little bit of, of leeway there, 10 to 15% to maybe help with those cases. But we're trying to re retrain students coming out of COVID. I think there's more of a, of a tendency to miss school because they've been out of school for so long and sometimes they don't think it's important to be there. But we're trying to reemphasize those points, the importance of attendance, and when you miss school, it affects achievement and other things. And as far as the home visits go, I mean, the social workers, the principals themselves, in some cases, they do the best they can. But when you're talking 25% at the high school, that's 300 students. Uh, so no, it's impossible to home visit. You know, they do the best they can when feasible and, and try to target, you know, the, the kids they think can benefit from that. <clears throat> I know it's a tough job. I just need that answer. Sure. I understand. Thank you. Dipper, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, could I? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. Um, I, one of the questions I, I have is, and I, I know absenteeism is, is an issue, I, and I understand that. Do we look at past years, uh, are we getting worse? Is this year a, a, a better year than maybe last year? And if so, do you, what do you attribute that to? Well, we are seeing improvement, certainly. You want to take that, Ms. Jeffrey? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, Last year, for the first time, social workers were being tasked with attendance, which was a very new task for us, uh, very exciting, but also a very learning curve for all of us. And this year, we have made great improvement because we have created a new team um, with counselor, engagement specialists, uh, principals, um, school social workers, all trying to work on the attendance. And so now the attendance is being placed on different shoulders. It is a better um, atmosphere and it's, all, it's a better um, task to, to manage. And yes, attendance is, is kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. But if we compare attendance to other counties, Caroline does not look that bad. Okay. And that is kind of the, the, the thing that I want to, to, to say. And <clears throat> I think everybody is working towards, I think the um, social emotional learning, creating the sense of belonging, the positive incentives, you know, giving away kind of a bike over at Lewis and Clark uh, Elementary School. So there are a lot of things that are being put in place to really drive um, the students to come to school. Okay, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned, I was gonna ask how we compared to some of the other counties, but you said, you kind of answered that. Just one more question. Uh, accreditation. Uh, how, how seriously is this impacting the accreditation of our schools? Well, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wick. I actually was hoping that someone would inquire regarding accreditation. I will share with you in the last meetings for the past three months that I have attended with the state superintendent and the 132 superintendents across the Commonwealth, we have advocated vigorously for the removal of chronic absenteeism permanently as an accreditation indicator. We believe it is a critical metric to monitor on a regular basis. As you can see, it requires an extensive body of employees to monitor but we feel that it is not applicable to accreditation status, and so we are requesting its removal. As of right now, the Board of Education has not been supportive of this, and so as a result, we will be moving forward this year with accreditation being impacted by chronic absenteeism. And as was accurately stated, 
I have not come across a division that is not demonstrating this level of attendance concern um, in this time period. Thank you, because that, that's serious business, because we really don't control that. And it's, it's tough to be evaluated on something over which you really don't have any real control. So thank you. That, that's a present code because they are doing their work, you know, remotely on Chromebooks or, or iPads and whatnot. So we still do not count that. We're allowed not to count to count COVID absences. But I do, I will say of the schools you saw up there, Mr. Spalding mentioned the two elementaries. Those schools have seen, um, have gone back from last year. They're a little bit worse right now. The other three have improved slightly. So we're seeing it both ways. Um, what are the reasons? I, I really can't tell you that because the social workers, the school social workers, school administration, they are all working very hard and diligently, the family engagement coordinators as well, the counselors. So they're doing a lot to, to help these kids get into school and, and to teach the importance of attendance. But it is complex, as you said, but we are working on it. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Wake, just to help make sure my brain is processing things right, would truancy be a better indicator if it were included just truant students alone in, uh, in, the, in the calculation? So your question is if, if we eliminated the excused absences and such and just, oh, that would drop it considerably, absolutely. So just focusing solely on students who are truant. Correct, yes, and the school social workers do focus, that's another part of their job. They got the chronic absenteeism, you could have a student who has nine absences right now that are all excused by the parent, but that's considered chronically absent. They're also working on the students who are unexcused and they're at nine or five or seven and they're dealing with that issue as well. So it's kind of a, a two-headed beast, if you will, that they're, that they're working on, both truancy and chronic absenteeism. I, I'm kind of not understanding. It seems to be, do our chronically absent students who are excused, do they have issues with being behind in their grading or in their studies or, or are they struggling or, or are students who are have the excused absences, are they doing okay? It depends on the student. I mean, some students are missing school and, and they're coming in, they're making up their work or if they're at the secondary level, they're doing their assignments on Schoology and whatnot. So you have some students who are being successful and then you have those who are not. So it just depends on the particular individual and their circumstances. Wouldn't some that suddenly kind of morph into a truant situation if their parent might be agreeing that they need to be absent? My question is, but how, when does the shift come to being truant even if they're excused, if they're not performing well? Truancy is strictly unexcused. Okay. <clears throat> so as long as we get a doctor's note or a parent note, now we limit the parent notes to 10. So once a parent hits 10 notes where the parent just says, you know, my kid was home sick today, once they hit 10, then we require third party documentation at that point. But that's 10 absences. So you probably have some students in that nine who have nine parent notes, which is nothing to do with truancy, but is chronic, chronic absenteeism. So as long as we have an excused note, that's chronic. If a kid has surgery and misses four weeks of school, chronic absenteeism. So it's definitely two different animals we're dealing with there. One, one more point to that. Um, we have seen an increase in mental health issues in this county and overall in Virginia. Well, and so, so, can you hear me? I can. Uh, we, we have seen increase in mental health um, overall, not just in Carolina, but in the Commonwealth of Virginia. <coughs> so mental health is really an issue and, and students are out because of that. So if we send a student to the hospital to be ECO'd or uh, being hospitalized, th that child is out for f seven days maybe. So that is counting against our um, chronic absenteeism. We have, in the middle school, we have an increase in risk assessment by 19% if we, if we look at the, at the data. And from last year to this year, we have a 46% increase. Think, think about that, we have mental health issue is really an issue. Right. And especially it was uh, 
magnified through the pandemic. And so we have to take that into account as well. Mr. Chair, I have one question um, for Mr. Wick and the staff. Are we taking this data and then breaking it down by subcategory? So do we know how many of these students are hospitalized or how many of these students are truly truant? Yes, we have. We're, okay. We have very specific codes in power school. Good. So if a student's out for surgery, for example, we put medical or for a doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. if, if the parent writes a note, it's excused. If it's, there's no note, it's unexcused. We have a court code, a vacation code. So we do have various codes so we can break that down. That's encouraging. Um, Mr. Chair, I want to also say thank you. I know that it was a shift for job duties for social workers to be involved in attendance. Um, but with that mental health piece and that social emotional learning piece, that is critical. And I'm also pleased to hear that we are not ruling with this iron fist of get your kids in here or you're going to court because we know that doesn't work. Um, and so I would just say it sounds like there's a call to the community to say not having students in school has this impact. We are here to help. Resources are available. Don't suffer in silence, but holding the community and families accountable also to saying learning loss is real. COVID did happen and we have to catch our students up because the argument is we can't teach children if they're not in school. So I think the definition of how this is framed, it's what hurting us yeah. because everybody's caught in that by definition yeah. so I don't think that these numbers really tell the true picture so I would be interested in a follow-up on what is that breakdown with power school um, because that then should be driving our efforts so not to get in the operations side of the house but from a governance uh, standpoint we own CCPS in our data so thank you for being transparent and that's my call to the community. You're very welcome. I do want to say real quick that we, we, we owe a lot of thanks to the court services, um, the court, the judges, the social, uh, social, um, social services, the FAP team. They do a lot to support us as well, and we work very well together to help with our absentee issues. <clears throat> And I do just want to make two small comments, a shout out to our social workers. We are blessed that we have a social worker in every single one of our buildings, all five comprehensive buildings that is not inclusive of Lotus Academy. And that is an anomaly, but you can hear the amount of attention and manpower that is going into attendance. If we can grab on to the call of action that Dr. Rollins Fells mentioned. This is a we, our, us scenario. It is going to take more than school-based employees to tackle this. We need our sheriff's office with our Sheriff Moser out back there. We need our faith leaders. We need our community civic organizations, and we need our households to know this data. And so as people are familiar with me talking about airing our dirty laundry. These numbers aren't pretty, but everybody needs to know these numbers because they're facts and they drive change. And so I have a call to action to our staff, to our communication specialist, Ms. Young, and to this team. Let's come together and brainstorm how we saturate our community with this information so we can create change. So come June, we're celebrating that we are a level two or even a level one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wick. And I know it's been very, very difficult. I know in my own household when out of nowhere, it's like everyone gets the flu. And so many, so many kids are sick. <laughs> um, moving on to CHS turf field design project with Chris Caldwell. Good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland members of the board and Dr. Kilbert. Tonight I would like to share with you a brief overview of the design of the synthetic turf field at Caroline High School. I'll be going over the current schedule, details in the progress, and next steps. Staff has found it in CCPS best interest to go ahead and get the design process started. This will afford us with the information needed to move forward in the future with fun fundraising, 
and construction. As you can see in, the above, in this above timeline, there are a few steps in getting CCPS ready for bid day. This process includes a survey of the field along with a soil study that will aid in the most important part of any field. The placement of the field within the track, the crown of the field, and the stormwater management. We will then be able to decide on material, the materials used for the field and the overall look. As you can see, the red line on the above timeline is placed at the time for public bidding. At this point, if funding was acquired, you can see the next steps and the time that would be needed as well for the actual disruption period for the completion, complete installation of the field. In early February, a design committee will be assembled to review the needs of CCPS sports programs in relation to the overall design of the turf field. The design committee will consist of CCPS Chief Operating Officer, Supervisor of Facilities, School Board Member, Caroline High School Athletic Director, Caroline High School Soccer, Football, and Field Hockey Coaches, our CCPS Communications and Community Engagement Specialists, Caroline County Board of Supervisor, Caroline County Director of Parks and Recs, along with student athletes. The committee will discuss the overall look of the field. They will also be vi visiting <coughs> other sports complexes in the area to review different looks and products available from different manufacturers to, to assist in the decision process. The site survey st study will study the current conditions with the crown of the field, placement of the field within the track, and bore samples of the subsoil. This will aid in the design of the new synthetic field. The new design will have the proper crown to improve playability, along with proper drainage needed for the new surface. It will also look at the impact that is absorbed from, the, from a fall to the field to meet impact standards to reduce concussions and improve the overall safety of our players. The soil study will give us all the details on how complex the drainage system needs to be. The drainage system is typically the largest component in the cost of field construction. As we know, if every sport line was placed on the field permanent, in permanent color, the lines can be very confusing to the players and officials. So the design process will incorporate the permanent lines in the fabric and hash marks needed for all sports so that special paint can be used to connect the lines when other sports are in season. We will also have a design of the end zones and logo placement within the field. At this time, we will also look at the D-rings on the ends of the fields. The design must have approval from DEQ for stormwater management. After their approval, we will be presented with the drawings and specifications that we need to go out for public bidding, along with what the project will cost to be completed. This will give CCPS the information that we need to acquire funding through Board of Supervisor funding, support, and or fundraising. I would like to thank you all for your attention. At this time, we'll entertain any questions that you might have. Are there any questions from the board? some supervisors just you know not 
in, in any capacity, but just talking. And we were talking about the, the turf. And there seems to be an idea that that turf uh, may be dangerous in some instances, um, or even to the point where some uh, NFL um, teams or, or some of the playing fields are they're, they're they're removing it. I don't know if that's true or not, and that's why I'm kind of asking: Do you do you know anything about that, or do you have? Can you respond to that? I have not seen or heard of anybody that's actually removing their fields. I've actually seen some localities around us that are actually replacing fields because they have actually gone through their life expectancy. Um, Stafford, Spotsylvania are still building new synthetic turf fields and they're keeping up with the program. Okay, so you don't know of any situation where it's dangerous or said to have been dangerous other than about 10 years ago there was a study that came out where they were suggesting there was probably a link to some some items of concern um don't have all those details in front of me but that went away pretty quickly okay thank I, you i can answer uh your question there nobody's taking it up what he's talking about when they first went out with artificial turf many years ago, it was put down on very, very hard surfaces, just like put down on concrete and so forth and all. And when you hit that, it, you hit concrete. And those were, those were pulled up, and the new, new turf is, uh, field that they put down now is, is well, you know, you, in football, you can get hurt anywhere. Right. And you can't just use, uh, uh, injury every now and then is well that's the turf's fault no not necessarily that's a lot of things fault but nobody is pulling up their artificial turf to put dirt down i can tell you that okay no and on and on that note i know that now we do they do require impact testing to done be done annually and certified okay i just don't want that to be used as an excuse not to fund it Okay. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, I have one question. Yep. When you were talking about the design committee, I think you might have left off um, athletic booster parents also being on that committee. Yes, they are also so on there. I just wanted to make sure yep. because, I mean, we need to make sure everybody has a part in this. So I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, just a point of correction. The Athletic Booster Parent Club is on the design committee, as stated on slide three of the presentation. Um, and I want to say thank you because we've been talking about this turf field for some time. Um, and we knew that there was some background work that needed to be done. Um, and so I think moving from a place of fact instead of a place of feeling is a good place for us to govern from. So thank you for putting the timeline together and getting the ball moving and rolling. Um, and so we'll be looking forward to supporting this as a budget item. Yeah, I have a couple quick questions. If you could go to the slide that has base and drainage system detail. <laughs> and I just want to make sure I understand this correctly because I've had these discussions before and I happen to work in a school division where every school has field turf. So if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, eventually the synthetic turf will have to be replaced at some point, but everything else underneath it, the stone, the open graded aggregate base, geotextile fabric, under draining piping system subgrade, that's all gonna be there for long term, correct? Yes, and typically your infill is removed with a vacuum system, it is stored, they roll the carpet back out, roll the new synthetic carpet out and use the infill that you had in the field back in after it goes through a cleaning process and then you do add infill on that on a regular basis as needed um, to make sure that your impact is, and concussion ratings stay down. All right, so this is, not, this is not a situation where we would have to spend the money to get the field turf, and then in X number of years, we're gonna have to spend that exact same amount or more again, because the replacement of the field turf, it's the synthetic turf would actually be a lot lesser down the road, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, also, so I know we currently have fields that are there with Bermuda grass on them. 
um, what would happen to the topsoil and everything that's taken off? In my vision right now, the topsoil that would be removed from the football field could be utilized on the practice fields to get those in a more favorable condition than what is out there now. Thank you. So not only do we, and you know, I think the biggest thing for me is I see where it, it like today where it's a light rain and if this is in the spring, we cancel everything. If this is in the fall, we cancel everything and every other division, they're able to play and proceed as normal. Whereas sometimes I know with our kids in the spring, they're going three days a week of game, 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 and it's just the, the injuries that you get from overuse like that because you're just hoping and praying that you get 70 degrees and sunny. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Carl. I, I look forward to this. My last question, though, is on the timeline. Because um, let's just say we're, we're in a perfect world and this all just moves forward and everybody's in agreement and we love this. If I'm looking at... <clears throat> August, September, October, November, December, 2023, we're ordering, delivering materials. What would then happen in 2024 um, to our sports as the excavation and installation would begin? Typically what has been happening in surrounding counties around us is the, any games that are in, that are supposed to be scheduled for home games through that construction period of January through April, they would, have made arrangements with the other opposing team to make their home game be at their home. And I know when Stafford did it, they actually were collecting um, gate money from the home team using utilizing their oh. fields. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and I know that those are the months that it's in least use yep. for the weather. Okay. Are there any other questions or concerns from – yes, Dr. Calvert? Mr. Caldwell, thank you so much for sharing this information. When you come back with an update, I would love for the committee to have some level of discussion with the school board about the potential financial impact in a lucrative mm -hmm. fashion um, associated with turf, meaning that we could host a variety of tournaments, we could have Parks and Rec be associated with different programming. So if that's something we could also highlight, I think that would be important for the community to be aware of as well. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I serve on the Virginia High School League Committee and we have a meeting next week. And so to your question, Mr. Taylor, I will put up some feelers and see what is everybody else's experience and I'll bring that back to the board as well. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. I look forward to comments from Dr. Jawanda rollins fells as she uh, utilizes her new um, <clears throat> ability to make friends in high places with the VHSL. Uh, moving on without any other questions, uh, monthly update on revenue, expenditures, and ADM with Doreen Flint. Good evening, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Dr. Calvaric. Um, for December, our operating revenues were $2,733,346.31. Year-to-date revenues, $23,290,046.50, or 43.44% of the operating budget. Special fund revenues for December were $369,588.84, and year-to-date is $2,389,941.08, or 15.71%. Total revenue in December for, for operating and special funds was $3,102,000, $935.15, or 37.31%. Operating expenses for December were $4,516,116.66. Year-to-date expenditures, $22,820,000, or 42.56% of the operating budget. Special funds expenditures for December were $670,445.86, and 
and year to date it's three million six hundred and seventy seven thousand five hundred and twenty six dollars and thirty four cent or twenty four point one eight percent total December expenditures were five million one hundred and eighty six thousand five hundred and sixty two dollars and fifty two cent or thirty eight point five percent any questions on revenues and expenses and where are we reconciled with the county too we are not mm -hmm. we have we have not to date received any any year to any reports from the county for FY 23 FY 23 not calendar year 23 fiscal so, fiscal year 20 we haven't received from July 1st through <coughs> December we haven't received any county reports Outstanding. Um, you can follow up with that in communication. Yes. Thank you so much for your report. I always ask that question. So I know that's perfectly fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. So now we'll move on to ADM. ADM for the month of December was four thousand two hundred and ten point six six seven. That's an increase of twelve point six one over November. And you all know that we are using our um, budgeted ADM is. 4,040. Any questions on ADM? Yes, ma'am. To what do you attribute the large increase to student to the student? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a transient number. We have um, <coughs> we have new students coming in. We have students leaving. So um, year to date, the total is four thousand one hundred and fifty-eight. That's still oh the, the That's dollar the, the dollar amount. No, ma'am. It's a hundred. And, your average is one hundred and ten seats over our budgeted ADM. And that's a large number of students when you multiply it times the cost of students that turns out to be a lot of money about seven hundred thousand dollars yes <laughs> as shared previously we have increased in our special education population by over 70 students so i would like to believe that word is on the street at what great services we are offering and how fabulous our staff is i do know that we have received um, students from neighboring divisions um, where potentially they have been experiencing some transition in their leadership. So I think we are seeing some of that impact from the special education world as well. So that, that's sort of what I was trying to push towards. Those are the statistics that I was trying to get you to get to. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Flint. Uh, we will now move on to item eight, consent agenda, which includes approval of school board meeting minutes, December 12th, 2022, January homeschool report, approval of donations, approval of school <coughs> financial reports. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. The motion has been made and seconded. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, please call for the vote. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Rollins Bells? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. <coughs> Item 9 Citizens Comments. The Caroline County School Board welcomes public comments during regular meetings and public hearings. Speakers may address an item on the board meeting agenda or an item not on the agenda during this time. All comments should address a matter related to Caroline County Public Schools and not an individual student related or personnel matter. Each speaker may speak up to three minutes. Once you see the red light on the traffic light positioned in front of the clerk, please make your last statement. Once you come up to the lectern, if you have not signed in with the clerk, please complete the appearance request form, state your name and your district. The school board expects that each speaker will be courteous, modeling for our students how one can respectfully disagree with others' views. Speakers will address their comments to the entire school board and not to one individual board member, nor to the superintendent, 
a staff member, or the audience. At this time, the clerk will call those that have signed up prior to the meeting. Lisa Richardson. Good evening. My name is Lisa Richardson and I'm from the Bowling Green District. I'm here um, again this tonight to um, talk about some of the issues faced by our special education students. Tonight I would like to discuss the missing part of the IEP. I would like to start off with a quick review of the four sections currently included in a Virginia IEP. Many special education experts state that needs drive goals and goals drive services, and three of the four IEP sections support that statement. The present level of performance is the section that determines a student's needs and includes information about a student's strengths and weaknesses. Many times this section includes subjective information provided by teachers. More importantly, this section needs to include objective data, such as standardized test scores to highlight a student's needs and to determine a baseline. Without a baseline, achievement expect expectations cannot be determined. The second section determines the appropriate goals to meet the student's needs. A common acronym used for writing goals is SMART. The acronym represents the five components that must be included for a goal to be effective. Goals must be specific, measurable, attainable, reasonable, and time-bound. The third section is accommodations. Accommodations are tools and scaffolds that can help a student master their goals. Accommodations can include items like preferential seating, small group testing, extra time on assignments, large print textbooks, communication tools, and many others. The fourth section is services. This section can include services such as occupational therapy and speech therapy, as well as placements such as self-contained or collaborative classes. Now we come to the missing piece, which is the creation of a plan to move a student from their baseline to the level needed to achieve their goals. As adults, we routinely set goals for ourselves, both personally and job related. I cannot imagine any of us setting a goal without some, time of, some type of plan in place to ensure success. However, currently it appears that no individualized plans are put in place when a student has an IEP. Many times the present level of performance does not provide adequate information for baselines to be determined. In addition, the goals are too general and cannot be objectively measured and mastery levels cannot be determined. How then do you determine when a child has met a goal? When progress reports are repaired, prepared, instead of being able to use objective data, subjective data is collected from teachers. Progress is reported using vague terms Ooh, I lost my place again, here we go. Such as emerging skill and insufficient progress without any documentation being supplied to define or support these terms. Another reason that a plan is important is that a significant number of SPED students require accommodations and specialized instruction. This is especially important for students who are placed in general education or collaborative settings. It is imperative that both the student's general and special education teachers understand what is in the plan and are on the same page. How can a student's needs be effectively met if there is no plan? As parents, we understand that due to COVID and teacher resignations that staffing levels are low, stress levels are high, and many issues are being worked on. However, our students cannot afford to wait until new teachers are trained and staffing levels return to normal. Isn't it ironic that although IEP stands for Individualized Educational Plan, many of our SPED students receive neither individualized or planned education. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I just thought I was gonna make it. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other individuals who have signed up?
All right. Hi. Good evening. I got a note. Ma'am, would you please state your name and your voting district? All right. I'm Tanya Tunstall, and I'm Maddie Panay. So I was listening to the um, chronic attendance thing, and, and I had some things to say, so that's what I'm going to do. So we have kids that go to school with fevers because they don't want to be absent. And this is proven not only by other students, but by my own kid. He had a fever, and he's like, I can't miss school. I might not walk. No, you have a fever. You can't go to school. Um, so they're spreading sicknesses and illness throughout the schools. This is not just the high school, because I got grandkids to do the same thing. I want to go to school. We get to color. I mean, and they're in the elementary. Elementary. Um, so if my kid has a fever, I'm not going to run and go rack up a doctor bill just because he's got a fever. I'm, I'm not doing that. I can't afford it. If he's got diarrhea, I'm not running to the doctor. If he's throwing up in the morning, I, I'm not running to the doctor. It just is not going to happen. And if he, is, if he does this more than 10 times in a year, I'm not running him to the doctor. It's just it's not feasible. Financially, I can't do it. I, it's just it's not going to happen. My son's a senior, and he has a compromised immune system. So he does have issues, and he wakes up sometimes, and he's not good, and he has to, I have to keep him home. And his whole thing is, I can't miss any days. I won't walk. No, that he should not have to worry about that. If he genuinely is sick, and I'm his mom, he's an, a four-sport athlete, so he doesn't want to miss school. But if he legitimately has a fever or he's woke up and thrown up as we're walking out the door to get in the car, I'm sorry, you can't go. And he gets angry with me. I call in Miss Spalding. I email, you know. I'm not going to run into the doctor for one-off things like that. That just, it just can't happen. Last week alone, my son was in wrestling practice. He said that there was two kids in there with a fever practicing wrestling because they can't miss school because they might not walk. That's ridiculous. My son never, ever wants to miss school. He never wants to stay home. I even have tried to get him to stay home and just skip one day, just spend it with me. No. Like when you're feeling good, just skip one day, spend it with me. No, he's got things to do. So I don't think that that whole attendancy, attendance thing, I don't think that that's fair. I know that it's not something Caroline County can control. I know that you guys don't put the rules in place, but I mean, I don't know what can be done, but something needs to be done because my son, would, he doesn't skip school like that. And I think that he's on the ninth day. I think he's missed nine or 10 days this year. Maybe not whole days, but they're still counted as absent. So that's just my opinion. I don't know what can be done, but I mean, that's ridiculous. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, is there anyone else from the audience who would like to comment? That's fine. I just please state your name and your voting district. Okay, my name is Amy Fletcher and I am in the Western Caroline Voting District. Um, not only am I a parent of three Caroline County students, but I am the president of the Caroline County, Caroline Cavaliers Football Club. Um, it is a club that I helped found really at the request of the last football coach that we had. It was an idea that was born of another school that he had worked at before. So we're not the same as the Athletic Boosters Club. We are separate, and we um, work to support the football program specifically. Um, not only with, um, you know, like team meals, uh, equipment needs, um, providing the extras, you know, that the budget does not allow. Uh, that's really our role, that's our goal, is to be able to provide the wants in a program, not the needs. Um, so I'm actually here to maybe get a little clar clarification around some of the things that were presented about the artificial turf. We're definitely invested in that. And when you compare us to most of the other schools in our district, the Battlefield District, most of the other schools have the artificial turf, um, with the exception, I think, of Culpeper and maybe one other one. Um, so in that regard, we're really behind. Um, and then when you compare us to maybe some other schools outside of our district that we play in those um, first couple of games, like 
uh, oh gosh, Tucker, um, not really in our district, but some of them are on their second turf field, <laughs> you know? So I feel like we are light years behind in that regard. We have worked closely with Mr. Heiser at the high school, the athletic director, and have met with him about um, many of the things you guys actually mentioned tonight, or Mr. Caldwell mentioned. Um, and we, we also ended up meeting with, um, well, Dr. Monroe had requested the meeting amongst um, both the Athletic Boosters Club, the football club, and some other um, folks like Mr. Just, Mr. Heiser, Mr. Caldwell. At that meeting where we talked about this turf um, field, it was stated that it would be presented as a priority item in the budget. And at December's meeting, that's not what was said. I, don't, I wanna make sure I didn't misunderstand that when, um, and I believe it was Mr. Caldwell that came up last month, he stated that the priority items, there were two, one of them I believe was in regards to the Lotus Academy, I don't remember what the other one was, but the turf field was not one of them. Did I misunderstand that? Well, the board will not answer specific questions at this time. If you'd like to send something in an email or someone would be willing to talk to her once the session is done. Yes, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Okay. Um, well, I guess that's it if we're not able to answer questions because I do have some. So um, whoever I can talk to afterwards, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, got the form done. <laughs> Certainly excited to be here tonight. Uh, Y'all have done a great Sir, job. Sir, would you tonight. mind stating your name, please, in Scott your voting Moser, district? Sheriff Nobody knows County. who you are. <laughs> yep, Bowling Green District. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, it's exciting to be here tonight. Uh, I get excited, so I missed all that. But uh, I just want to talk a little bit about your staff. We're certainly committed to the safety of our kids here. We want a safe learning environment for our student here, students here in Caroline County. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your commitment to an SRO in every single school that we have in here in Caroline County. Uh, that's tremendous. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have that. But I cannot imagine a better partnership than we have with Dr. Kaverick, Dr. Monroe, Jeff Wick, between the sheriff's office and your staff. They have been fantastic, and we're in constant communication on weekends and night uh, about the safety of our kids. And I really appreciate the efforts that they make to make our partnership work as it has in the past, and we'll continue with that partnership. Uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Monroe inviting me to the CTE meeting and uh, the three E's, and we were able to look at that and say, hey, the sheriff's office can participate in, in this, uh, the employment part. So we wanna do an externship and an internship with the students of Caroline so that they can actually come to our dispatch center and learn how to be a dispatcher, either get familiar with it through the externship or have actually be employed through the sheriff's office and have an internship. And when they finish, they can be a fully certified dispatcher and they can get a job with Caroline County. If we have an opening, if not, if that's something they're interested in, they can go to Stafford, Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, it doesn't matter. But that's part of the, the 3E program, obviously. It was very impressive, and I said, well, as a new sheriff, that's one thing that we can do to help our kids become successful in life. So I'm trying not to go through the red light. You know, it wouldn't be good for a police officer to go through the red light. So, uh, but thank you for entertaining me tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak. And I uh, just wanted to thank you and your staff for their wonderful job that they're doing. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, are there any other citizens who would like to make comments at this time? Are there any other citizens who would like to make comments? 
Hearing none, uh, if there are no additional comments, the citizen's comment period is closed. We will now move on to uh, item 10 under action items, approval of policy IIA and IIAB with Dr. Monroe. Chairman Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Calvary, this evening I'm sharing information for the second read of policies IIA instructional materials and policy IIAB supplementary materials and adoption. Guidelines concerning instructional materials with sexually explicit content are enacted by Code of Virginia 22.1-16.8. The Act, guidelines that comply with the Act ensure that children are not exposed to any sexually explicit content without prior parental notification. The definition of sexually explicit content is found in Board Policy IIA. I know that over the weekend um, I submitted a document with our process in order to adhere to policies IIA and IIAB. Again, in your board packet this evening, the Division Review Committee created a draft of procedures to ensure CCPS is compliant to the Virginia Code, including notification to parent, parental rights to review instructional materials, parental rights to alternative instructional materials, parental right to request school review of instructional materials, procedures for handling challenges to the use of instructional materials, CCPS instructional material yearly review, and the CCPS request for reconsideration of instructional material form. CCPS leadership and site-based teams are prepared to implement policies IIA and IIAB with fidelity. Are there any questions? And if not, we ask the board to adopt revisions and additions to policy IIA and IIAB. Are there any questions regarding the proposed policies? Mr. Chair, I move for the approval of policy IIA and IIAB as presented. The motion has been made and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing none, I ask the clerk to call for the roll. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mrs. Carson? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Abstain. Abstain. Dr. Rollins Fells? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to 10B, Budget and Amendment Number 4, School Improvement Grant SIG Award. On January 9th of 2023, the Office of School, Qual School Quality approved school improvement grant funding for Caroline Middle School in the amount of $47,132.14. On January 11th of 2023, the Office of School Quality approved school improvement grant funding for Bowling Green Elementary School in the amount of $91,779. Caroline Middle School will continue with professional development and Kagan strategies and the grant will pay the teachers while training off contract materials and supplies needed for implementation and additional training provided by Kagan. Bowling Green Elementary will also utilize Kagan strategies and pay teachers for professional development while training off Kagan on while training off contract on Kagan and letters. In addition, purchases will be made of the letters bundle and additional Kagan training provided by Kagan staff. The school improvement grants for the 2022-2023 grant cycle will expire in September of 2023. CCPS is seeking appropriation of budget amendment number two for the school improvement grants. CCPS staff will be seeking Board of Supervisors appropriation of the school improvement grant funding after school board approval at their, one, at their January 24th, 2023 Board of Supervisor meeting on their consent agenda. So we're asking for approval of budget amendment number two for the school improvement grants. Yes, sir.
second. Point of clarification. Um, is it budget amendment number two or four? Two. It's two. Number two. Yep. Clarification, it is number two. Mr. Copeland, would you like to amend? Yes. <laughs> it's in the motion as number two. All right. Thank you. The motion has been made and properly seconded. Are there any, is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll ask the Ms. Stevens to call for the vote. Dr. rollins Fells. Aye. Mrs. Carson. Aye. Mr. Copeland. Aye. Mr. Taylor. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Motion passes. Moving on to new business 11A, first read draft instructional calendar 2023-2024 with Dr. Monroe. Good evening again. Chairman Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, members of the board, and Dr. Kelberic. It is a plum pleasing pleasure to share the proposed CCPS instructional calendar for the 2023-24 school year. This evening's presentation will include a visual of the proposed instructional calendar, recognizing all calendar committee members for their input and gift of time, an overview of the VDOE mandates around calendar, survey results, as well as instructional highlights and benefits. I would like to quickly walk you through a high level overview of the collaborative calendar process that led to a proposed calendar supportive of the school division's mission and goals. The 33 member calendar committee met in November to create a draft calendar to meet all VDOE requirements such as a 180 instructional day or the 990 teaching hours. The committee then reconvened in January to review the 717 survey responses to create responses for frequently asked questions and to ensure hours were built in for professional development, teacher planning, and inclement weather days. It took a lot of teamwork to make the calendar dream work, so I would like to kindly thank the members of the calendar committee for their gift of time. The calendar committee consisted of teachers, administrators, principals, PTA members, parents, school board representation, and two school board members, in addition to feedback from numerous stakeholder groups, such as our pastor, parent, support staff, teacher, athletic, business, and student advisory groups. I would like to publicly thank Christy Shaw and Marcia Stevens, who were statisticians in making sure our seat hours and employee contractual hours met all local and state mandates and VDE requirements. VDOE mandates. The CCPS instructional calendar exceeds the 990 teaching hours required by the DOE. Teachers have a 200-day teacher contract with 186 work and PD days that include evening events, nine days for planning, and seven two-hour late arrivals. Paraprofessionals work on student days and have seven PD work days. The state requires 140 seat hours for verified credit for on-time graduation, and our proposed calendar starts the year at 140.5 seat hours. We no longer have the state waiver for seat hours and therefore can no longer make special provisions to give additional days off outside of the days listed on this proposed calendar. For this reason, for example, we cannot grant additional days off to have a full week for Thanksgiving break. The calendar committee was impressed by the 717 survey responses and the 476 calendar comments. There were four major questions asked in various ways and three major suggestions that I will cover in the next slide. Let's start with question one. Why are students off on election day? Well, it is actually unsafe to have students in the building while the community has total access to our buildings during election day. Question two, why do we start school before Labor Day? Well, according to Virginia Code 22.1-79.1, all school divisions in Virginia may set the school calendar such that the first day students are required to attend can be before Labor Day. In addition, CCPS falls in the category of pre-Labor Day schools that must close each school in the school division from the Friday immediately preceding Labor Day through Labor Day. To date, over 90 
out of 132 school divisions have a pre-Labor Day start. We have found that a pre-Labor Day start allows our students to be better prepared for local, state, and national assessments, performance adjudications, and extracurricular competitions. Question three, can we do a half-day early release instead of a late arrival? Well, it is better and more beneficial to have a two-hour late arrival. Um, our community is very familiar with a two-hour late arrival, and it also allows for more instructional time. In addition, it also does not impact after-school programming, any extracurricular activities such as clubs, tutoring, and athletics. Question four, why can't we do a full week for Thanksgiving? As stated in the previous slide, the state requires 140 seat hours for verified credit for on-time graduation, and our proposed calendar starts the year at 140.5 seat hours. We no longer have the state waiver for seat hours, and therefore can no longer make special provisions to give additional days off outside of the days that are proposed. However, we, the board still has the power to do individual student waivers for extenuating circumstances student by student. The three major suggestions that emerged from the committee's review of the calendar comments were one, can we do a one two hour late arrival versus two one hour late arrivals? Suggestion two, instead of getting out Friday, December 22nd, can we start winter break on December 20th and allow teachers a planning day on January 2nd and students return on January 3rd? Three, have, have parent-teacher conferences after report card dis distribution. The calendar committee was able to accommodate most calendar recommendations while ensuring all mandates were made in supporting a high-quality teaching and learning instructional calendar. Let's take a look at the actual calendar at this time. The draft calendar has, four, has a four-day new teacher work week with five-day preparation week for all staff with the first day of school on August the 14th. The last Wednesday of every month will be our two-hour late arrival. This will give families a consistent day each month to plan and make the needed arrangements for the two-hour late arrival. This new addition to our calendar is essential for teacher planning, recruitment and retention, work-life balance, and employee collaboration. We also built in the suggestion on winter break starting on December 20th, teachers having a planning day on January 2nd, and students returning to school on January 3rd. We also have Good Friday off, which is March 29th, being that Easter is on March 31st in 2024. We also have embedded three inclement weather days, October 16th, February 19th, and March 29th, and our last day of school will be May 23rd. Being that parent-teacher student conferences go into the evening hours, we decided to hold them on October 12th and February the 15th, as both days are followed by a student holiday and a teacher work day. The February 15th date will also give our secondary students three weeks to complete any missed assignments and also allow for early conversations in reference to elementary student achievement and any potential retention talks or conversations with parents. Our school hours will remain relatively the same. However, we had to add five minutes to the Caroline High School day to ensure the appropriate number of seat hours. As you can see, our middle school start time will be 725, and they will dismiss at 230. Our high school will start at 730 a.m. and dismiss at 240, and our elementary schools will start at 850 and dismiss at 330. Calendar celebrations and highlights. Our proposed 2023-24 instructional calendar, again, supports high-quality instruction. It meets all of the instructional mandates by the Virginia Department of Education. It allows seven two-hour late arrival days and the pre-labor day waiver qualifications and benefits I have shared in the earlier slide. It will benefit our students both academically and extracurricularly. Together, we will design an academic calendar that supports high-quality teaching and learning. 
The calendar committee feels as though we have done so. And at this time, I would ask the board if there are any questions. Are there any questions from the board? I have a question for clarity, Mr. Chair. The last Wednesday of each month with a two hour delay, that was a favorable response in the community survey? Yes, the uh, feedback that we received suggested that it would be too burdensome, if you will, to have two one hour delays a month. So the compromise, if you will, was can we go with one two hour delay per month? And uh, the committee, again, viewed that in getting teacher feedback and getting feedback from our committees that I mentioned, everyone felt as though that would be a reasonable compromise. And also the committee worked diligently to decide on a set day so that uh, families could have consistency. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the board? Dr. Monroe, thank you very much, uh, and huge amounts of appreciation to the committee and the work that they do. I know that it is very time consuming, especially you and the staff looking at all the dates, crunching all the numbers, and doing the math. I'm a social studies teacher, so I, I really appreciate you doing the work and not me. Uh, well, I will say it was a team effort, um, and as we say, teamwork always makes the dream work. Yes, sir. Here in Hashtag One Carolina. Thank you, and we look forward to adoption next month. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to 11B, first read uh, CHS Esports Club with Karen Foster. Good evening again, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Copeland, Dr. Calvaric, and members of the board. Tonight I come before you to provide information in a first read that will be requesting compensation for CCPS Esports Sponsorship. This evening, I will provide you a high level overview of eSports, the CHS eSports Club, and a request to compensate sponsorship. eSports officially stands for electronic sports, not to be confused with video games. eSports takes video gaming to another level with organized competitive gameplay between two teams governed by its own strict set of rules and guidelines. The difference is comparable to a pickup game of basketball at a park versus a varsity high school basketball game. Esports requires teamwork, communication, critical and strategic thinking, creativity, sportsmanship, and leadership, much like traditional sports. The VHSL has extended the status of esports. It has an emerging, emerging status um, currently. VHSL Executive Committee voted at the end of last year to reset the clock for esports and its emerging, emerging status in the league. This means that the league has until the end of the 2023-24 academic year to determine if esports will become a fully sanctioned and sponsored activity under the emerging activity guidelines. Caroline High School has had students participating in eSports for the past two years with between five and nine students meeting weekly with a volunteer sponsor one to two times a week. The VHSL breaks competition into two seasons with the fall season beginning in early September concluding in December with state championships and the spring season running from February through May again with state championships concluding in May. Esports can provide a gateway to colleges and universities. The National Association of Collegiate Esports, or NACE, the main governing body for varsity collegiate esports, has awarded millions of dollars in esports scholarships and aid over the last five years. Currently, more than 200 colleges and universities offer nearly $15 million in scholarships. Esport majors and careers are becoming increasingly more accessible. There are growing opportunities to find employment in esports related careers. These opportunities include broadcasting, marketing, graphic design, multimedia production, hospitality, coaching, and management. Tonight, I bring before you the first read to request to provide a $1,000 stipend for an esports sponsor for VHSL competition. 
Reminder, the last two years we have had somebody who has been volunteering their time one to two days a week for the duration of the school calendar. The recommendation is that the stipend would be divided in half for a fall season and spring season. This stipend would be commensurate with a stipend for our Scholastic Bowl sponsor, which is similar in sponsor commitment and student participation. Thank you, and at this time, do you have any questions? Otherwise, I'll see you back next month. Are there any questions from the board? I want to ask one, but I'm not going I'll to. i see you it. there, Coach. <laughs> I just know there's a lot of money in college because I teach in high school and I thought that this was kind of like, I don't know, I just kind of rolled my eyes at it and I could just see my dad screaming at me saying, you know, why are you wasting your life playing video games? But then I work in a high school and there's kids who are going on almost a full ride to play these games. And what's the weirdest thing I think I've ever heard of in my life is these guys will play the games, they will live stream it, and sponsors will pay them money because kids will just watch them play video games for hours and like, oh, you can learn all these great tricks. I'm like, I guess. But, you know, if it's going to help them get an education down the road, and like you said, get um, learn how to be on a team and work collaboratively w with others and opening career opportunities for children, I think that's the most important thing. So absolutely. Thank you very much, Miss Foster. I look forward to uh, next month as well. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll move forward with item 12, board committee reports and comments. And as is tradition, we will start on the far right with Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Um, I'm going to pass on comments and the two uh, committees I serve on, largely, uh, not committees, the uh, governor schools are in reorganization, so there's not a lot going on. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. <coughs> yes, I, I usually don't comment, but uh, uh, first of all, I didn't get a chance to thank Joanda for the job that she's done these past few years. Uh, she's been on on the ball on everything, uh, and I really appreciate the work that she's put in, and I'm, I'm sure the county was and all too. Uh, so th thanks again, Joanda. Now my questions are: If you're playing esports. Do you have to get a physical for that? <laughs> now, my second question is this. You notice all this money that you're talking about up here? This is what's wrong with college sports today. If you read the paper or watch TV, I still read the paper. If you watch TV, you'll see where these kids are moving from one college to another because their sponsor is getting them more money at one of the other colleges than where they've already signed for and so forth. Now, these kids are going to be playing this finger sports that we're talking about here. These, these companies are not dumb. The more they play them, the more they're going to sell them, right? And, I mean, I just had to throw that in. So find that out. Well, I'll be talking to Billy Hahn tomorrow anyway. I'll ask him. He, I bet he's big, in, big on this. Thank you. Finger sports. 
<laughs> Dr. Jawanda Rollins Fells. I prided myself in my professional decorum. <laughs> thank you, Coach. Um, thank you, Mr. Tabler. Um, I was not ready. Okay. January 16th was Martin Luther King uh, Day. That's the day that we observed. And so I, we would be remiss if we did not honor um, the life, the legacy, and the service of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I wanted to share just a couple of quotes from that as we reset ourselves in 2023. Through COVID and through the past few years of um, my service on this board, it has been an honor to serve with all of you. This is not the end, so I don't even want to set that tone and that tenor. Um, but it is time for new leadership. Um, and I want to say thank you to you guys because um, as MLK said, we would be able to, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And we have served together in some tough times. Um, and we have been able to do that. Um, Dr. Calvaric shared about, you know, airing our dirty laundry um, and being transparent with our data. And even with that, this board is encouraging a stone of hope from that mountain of despair. To Mr. Kelly, I am, was proud to nominate you for the chair um, and a reminder to you that a leader is one who knows the way, who goes the way, and who shows the way. So lead knowing that you have the support of the group. This evening, the meeting was prolonged greatly with a conversation about chronic absenteeism. Um, and so I made a note, we can't scold and we can't make excuses. It's just one of those things that we've just got to work together on. And so we just ask everybody to do what we call in my household as your reasonable service. If you are healthy and able, please value education and come to school. Um, thank you, Dr. Monroe, for providing the clarity about the survey with the two-hour delays on the last Wednesdays of each month change is something that has to be managed um, and so i know that with the awesome work of our communication team and our principals that we will make sure our community is prepared uh, for that change um, in terms of committee reports um, in the month of december and so far in january um, mr kelly serves as the eastern region chair of vsba i serve as the at-large member and we had on our executive board meeting um, at that meeting, there were two notable uh, collaborative conversations. One was with VEA and one was, the other one was with VAS. And so the conversation was really about making sure that we are communicating with one another, the superintendents with the operational day-to-day -day side of the house, as well as governance with our policy and rules. So that was very encouraging and to meet with the union reps that speak on behalf of teachers. Um, as I stated previously, um, I am the rep uh, for the Virginia High School League, and my first meeting with them is on Monday, and so I will be very sure not to say finger sports and get put out of the committee before I get on it good. So thank you, Coach, for that lesson. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carson? Yes, that, and Juwanda, thank you for your service and leading us into becoming the master board, the board of distinction, and the board of the year, because I don't know we could have done as well if you hadn't been at the helm. Um, on this Wednesday, the 25th, the Caroline Educational Foundation will be having a meeting, and anyone that would like to come join the committee, we, we are always looking for new, fresh faces. I've gotten another um, business to come join us on that day and we're, we need more people to help us raise money so we can endow more people to become teachers and keep on sponsoring the teacher as leaders. <clears throat> I had a have had a pleasure doing the mentor program. I have a fourth grader at Lewis and Clark, and she is a shy little girl, and we have a wonderful time twice a month getting together and just talking, and she, it's been as good for me as I hope it's been for her. And then I just wanted to say, um, February 10th is the last basketball game of the season, and um, I usually try to send the scores of the JV and the varsity to Dr. Calvaric every, every evening, and they're gonna have a whiteout that night. It's gonna be their final season. It's gonna be a whiteout, so everybody come wearing a white shirt, is what I was told, Mr. Just. I don't know if that's right. Or that's correct. That's oh. what I out okay, <laughs> so, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Courtney.
speaking. I just want to say that I am honored to begin my tenure as the 2023-2024 school board representative. The Caroline County School Board is an in integral part of our school division and our community, and I am looking forward to being a part of this organization and learning along the way. As the student school board representative, I want to serve as a voice to the elementary school and secondary students. Starting this month, I would like to give highlights of great things that are happening at all schools. I am hoping that with this platform, I can inform this board and our community about the great things of our students and teachers in the CCPS. Highlights of excellence in our schools this month are following. Joel Washington, a BGE student, fourth grade student to be exact, was the division spelling bee winner and Jaden Jordan, eighth grade runner up. Joel will advance to the Fredericksburg Regional Convention which will be held February 25th, 2023 at 10 a.m. at James Monroe High School in the auditorium. CMS Student Department, si excuse me, Science Department, begin their work with Dow Green and the Science Expo for the spring. Also, CMS hosted their third round of visits and tours with the rising sixth graders. They were all they were shown elective op options, participated in Q&A questions, and walked the school with their tour guides. At CHS, the Scholastic Bowl team has demonstrated great improvement. Ms. Kramer developed an Ms. Kramer developed a student abuse seminar for the student body at CHS. The school was divided into groups and participated in a 30-minute seminar with four panel members. The amazing staff at Lotus was awarded the VASCD Team Award for Excellence. Students at Lotus Academy helped us to understand why Monday, January 15th, was an, a holiday by writing an amazing reflection, narratives in the honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Thank you. Um, f for my comments, I'll, I'll try to be really brief. Um, first of all, when Mr. Clark came up here and spoke about middle school athletic director, I'd like to really quick point out that we are not the same as schools in the north and schools in the south. We do not have, our students do not have easy access to travel sports, or facilities that some of these other schools have um, with larger populations. The middle school is the time where we traditionally lose a lot of our students. We get them in elementary school, they're extremely active. The parents that I've always seen are there almost every day after school helping out. And at the middle school, we, we start to lose them. And Mr. Clark has been abs absolutely phenomenal and going above and beyond in reaching out to parents, reaching out to staff to get sponsors for teams and clubs. And for a lot of our children, this really is their only way to, to, to go out there and express themselves and be a part of a team and find something that's better than themselves. Um, just this past Saturday, I was absolutely amazed when the middle school team had their um, one and only home swim meet. And special thanks to the YMCA for allowing that group of kids to go in there. I think we have about probably close to 10 kids that have never participated in the sport before and it's been absolutely wonderful. But there, there was Mr. Clark walking around with a couple of bags of snacks for the kids and pushing his child around the YMCA, um, which I thought was adorably cute, but also demonstrate his commitment. Um, special shout out to uh, Kelsey Cullinan and Kimmy Smith for coaching that team, uh, not getting a stipend and just volunteering, and Kelly Shields, the assistant coach at the high school, for showing up to that meet on her day off. Um, to the board, I want to be really clear about this. I'm going to make mistakes. 
there's an expression in sports where they say, you don't want to be the guy that follows the guy. You want to be the guy that follows the guy that follows the guy. And unfortunately, I'm following the guy. Um, the gal. The, the gal. The gal. <laughs> Spalding, Carson, and Dr. Jawan Rollins fellows have done a fantastic job as board chairs of my time here on, as a board member. And I'm going to try not to get choked up. I can say I've been teaching for over 20 years, and being the chairperson of this board is easily the greatest achievement of my professional career. Mm -hmm. To be able to be up here with these people who are by far the best board in the state of Virginia, I will do my absolute best um, to lead you to where we need to go. That being said, we got work to do. Pat ourselves on the back. I'm glad that we're heading in the right direction. It's budget season and it's time to get to work. We have a lot of things that we need in this community and we have a lot of people that are emotionally and deeply invested in the outcome of our students and I look forward to everybody participating and helping us out with that. That concludes my comments. Uh, at this time, we will go to item 13A, superintendent's comments. <laughs> Thank you. It's always challenging to be the last party to speak after so many accolades and summaries of various activities occur. Um, but I do just want to pause and take a moment to acknowledge our, our outgoing chair and vice chair and welcome our incoming. They are a blessing to me because every superintendent comes to work each day and hopes to have a board that will question them, that will listen to them, that will offer advice, will seek for understanding. And that is what I'm given every day. So thank you to each of the six of you. And I look forward to working with Mr. Copeland and Mr. Kelly in this new capacity. I also want to give a shout out to the number of speakers that we had this evening. Not only did we have our new sheriff come and speak at Open Comet, we had our SEAC representative come, we had our Caroline uh, football organization come forward and speak, and then we had general presenters or speakers from our employee base. And we love hearing from you. I, you have seen me writing feverishly up here throughout the whole meeting, and I have taken copious notes. And tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, our senior staff will be getting together and we literally sit down and we go item by item through all of our takeaways, things that went well, areas we can enhance and things that we need to have action on. So if you came to the podium seeking a response, you better believe we will be in touch with you. We want to know what your questions are. We want to be responsive and we want to take action where appropriate. But it made my heart really happy to see people at the podium. We want that. We need that. We love advocacy. We're not always going to agree, but we still want to hear from you. So thank you. Um, just three small things. Well, one is large, but two are small. Um, the first is we have our second community engagement event where we come into the community. First was kickball. Second is bingo night. So you may see this flyer that I am holding up for those that are with us this evening um, out and about on Facebook. We have multiple locations. We're so blessed to have amazing partners in education, not only who are hosting the event, um, at Port Royal, um, at the fire department, at County Line Baptist, at St. Peter's Church, um, at Wright's Chapel, Bowling Green Baptist, um, Caroline's Promise, Cardinal Baptist Church, Parent Teacher Resource Center. Some of them are hosts and some of them are providing all of our snacks and all of our prizes. So together we are creating this amazing wintertime indoor activity for free. So we look forward to seeing you on February 7th from 6 to 7.30. Um, the second item to be aware of is Global Day of Play. Our current teacher of the year, Jamie Carter, who is serving during the 20. 223 school year is passionate about the power of play in the lives of children and adults. So the National Day of Play is scheduled across the nation for February 1st, and all five of our schools will be participating in some capacity. Uh, we look forward to meeting with our middle school and our high school superintendent advisory students on Friday. We're going to be planning a sweet little video that they will create themselves. It might be a TikTok, depending on what they choose to do. And then that will be shared with students to advertise the day of play. Um, but we all know, one, it's a breath of fresh air, but it also creates innovation and creativity in the school environment. And then the third more heavy topic that I feel would be remiss of me not to acknowledge is 
the large number of traumatic safety events that have been occurring for um, the last couple of weeks across the Commonwealth. Um, certainly keeping Dr. Parker, our former superintendent prior to my tenure, um, in our thoughts and prayers in Newport News as the kindergarten teacher um, fell victim to um, a, a tragic scenario. Um, and we also know that one of our neighboring divisions in Henrico recently um, this past week had a loaded gun that was also um, identified and safely um, taken by their partnership with the Sheriff's Department. And I share those specifics with you because we have to together as a community do prevention, preparedness, and readiness for response. And that begins not only with all of the multiple endeavors we're doing here at CCPS, but also in our community. Eyes and ears everywhere. Talk to your children, look at their social media, check their book bags. And it sounds very intrusive to some people, but this is what helps us get tips to investigate that save lives. And we need to do this hand in hand. So add that to the call to action. You know, be aware of chronic absenteeism. If your sick child needs to stay home, stay home by all means. Um, but, you know, please be engaged, engaged in attendance and engaged in safety. So with that, I yield the floor. Um, and just one more shout out, congratulations to Major, or Major Mosier, who I knew to retrain my brain to now call Sheriff. Thank you, Dr. Calvaric. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion for approval to enter closed session for the purpose of the superintendent's personnel agenda for the discussion of appointments, resignations, corrections, position changes, requests for FMLA stipends, recommendations for dismissal, rescission, retirement, leave of absence, and substitutes as authorized by section 2.2-3711A subsection 1 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. Second. The motion has been made and seconded. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, please call for the vote. Mr. Spalding. Aye. Dr. Rollins Fells. Aye. Mrs. Carson. Aye. Mr. Copeland. Aye. Mr. Taylor. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Closed session.
We are returning back from closed session. I'm looking for an approve, approval to return to the school board public meeting. So moved. The motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Please call for the vote. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Dr. Oh, Mr. Copeland? Abstain. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Um, Ms. Carson? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. I will now entertain a motion for the superintendent's personnel agenda as presented. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. I can continue to do the personnel agenda. So I'll call for the vote. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Aye. Mr. Mr. Copeland abstain. Mr. Spalding. Aye. Mrs. Carson. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Approval of certification of closed session. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Mr. Taylor. Aye. Mr. Spalding. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Carson. Aye. Mr. Copeland. Aye. School board matters of interest. Upcoming events, Board of Supervisors meeting on February 14th. Uh, school board, no workshop on February the 13th. We will have our regular, I'm just Clarifying that there is no workshop for February 13th. Is that correct, Mrs. Superintendent, Dr. Calvaric? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, so we can meet here at 5:30. The legislative capital conference is in Richmond, January the 30th, January 31st. New board, new board members, new chair, new vice chair orientation is also in Richmond. I'm going to repeat this so it's a matter of public record because your microphone was off. So we do have a workshop session at 4.30 yes. on the 13th yes. for the budget. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> Any other matters of interest that board members would like to share at this time? Hearing none, I will now entertain a movement to adjourn. So Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No? All right. Let's call for the vote. All those in favor? No, we can't do that. We can't do that? Sorry. Um, Mr. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Copeland? Aye. Mr. Spalding? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Carson? Aye. Good night.